か。The Mario Kart franchise has been burning rubber for over 30 years now, and if that number makes you feel old, then you're in the right place because we're all about the nostalgic gaming memories here, and none are more fond than going around to a friend's house and jamming some Mario Kart, throwing shells and bananas, and using your cunning skills to take that top spot on the podium. This franchise not only laid the foundation for party multiplayer gaming and the kart racing genre as we know it, but it has remained on top as the longest running and most successful in its field, continuing to innovate with every new release. So, if I was to propose the question, what is your favourite Mario Kart level out of the entire franchise? Well, that's a pretty big ask because there are just so many great classic. Iconic, awe-inspiring levels throughout this long series of games that it feels almost impossible to think of a top 100, let alone a top 50 or even a top 10. But that's exactly what we're going to do today because we'll be ranking every single Mario Kart level. Let's begin. Now I'm a PlayStation kid, so I actually didn't grow up with these games beyond what I played while staying over with friends and family. So I spent the past few months casually making my way through all of the games, every course revision, and all of the booster packs for Mario Kart 8 Deluxe with a fresh, unbiased set of eyes. Now, as usual with these every level ranked videos, we're focusing on unique courses. Any themes and layouts that we can lump in together to make things a little easier will be considered. Considered as a single spot on the list. This includes retro courses that have appeared multiple times in later games. We'll be taking those versions into account when ranking each level's design, layout, soundtrack, and fun factor. Now you're probably thinking that doesn't seem very fair on the older 2D locations, but thankfully many of these have been faithfully remastered over the years, so everything can be judged on equal footing here, regardless of the games that introduce them. Oh, and I think this should go without saying, but we're not going to be including any levels from Mario Kart Home Circuit because, I mean, one, it's not a legitimate Mario Kart game, and two, well, it just wouldn't be fair on all of the other stages if I was to make my own course and give it the top spot. I mean, that is if the wheels don't get clogged up with dirt and dog hair in the process. So, following all of those guidelines, taking into consideration the primary eight entries in the franchise, as well as Mario Kart Tour and the arcade games, that brings us to a total of 156 unique levels to rank, which is quite the undertaking. Of course, we're not including any battle arenas in the rankings. However, we will be looking to see which Rainbow Road and which Bowser's Castle stage claims the title of the best in their respective sets. But thinking on this for a while now, we need to start at the bottom. But I can't recall anything actually bad ever coming from Mario Kart. I mean, sure, there's plenty of generic, mid-tier, and samey sort of levels, which, trust me, we will get to those. But a course that is just legitimately awful. Well, I can only think of one. So let's kick off this ranking with the absolute worst Mario Kart course ever conceived. Yup, it's Wario Stadium. This level sucks. It's too damn long. It's ugly to look at. Nothing happens. Even Nintendo understands how crap this is because it's the only level from '64 which has never appeared in another game. 
Yeah, if you want to play Wario Stadium, then you're going to have to dust off your N64, and honestly, why would you want to? Even professional Mario Kart fans don't want to play this abomination, so they aim to get it over with as quickly as possible. I've never met a racer in all of my years who actually enjoys this map, and if you are that one person, then please out yourself with a comment so that I can make fun of you. It's a shame because stadium maps are often some of the most memorable in a lot of cases. Maybe I'm being a bit rough on it because this was the first of its kind, but I can tell you right now, there are plenty of other locations from this game earning high spots on the list, so there are just no excuses for this one. So congratulations Wario, you've kicked mud in all of our faces and earned yourself the King Pooper Award for this crappy map. Just missing out on the bottom spot is Vanilla Lake, 1 and 2 from the original Super Mario Kart. Now, don't get me wrong, these levels are loathsome, possibly even more annoying than Wario Stadium, but at least they're short. But that still doesn't make up for the fact that they're hard to look at, infuriating to navigate, and simply never got any better over the years. I know the graphics were limited back in the day, but if you can have 3D pipes and other objects in the background as decoration, then why can't these annoying ice cubes also be 3D? Instead, they're just flat textures on the ground like everything else and next to impossible to see. I hate these things. But even in Mario Kart Tour, they're still just as annoying as they bring your vehicle to a dead stop and all of this other 3D junk they've added in to try and fix these courses simply isn't enough. In fact, let me just make it clear right now. Tour has a lot of these remix variations on classic levels, which, in my honest opinion, doesn't stay true to the original intent of these maps. So I'm simply not going to be including these variations. Okay, we cool on that? We're purist Mario Kart fans here, and I think that every purist Mario Kart fan can appreciate simplicity when it's done well, which Vanilla Lake fails at in every aspect. Now, unfortunately for these next few circuit courses, they're straight up too simple to leave any lasting impact, so let's knock a few of these out in rapid succession, shall we? Figure 8 from the introductory Mushroom Cup in the DS game really undersells the otherwise profound impact that this entry had on the series. I mean, sure, there is nothing technically wrong with it, but this is just plain boring and more vanilla than Vanilla Lake. I mean, even the most basic introductory courses still have some jumps or simple hazards on the track. This one has nothing. The same can be said for Toad Circuit on the 3DS. I mean, if you actually look at it, this is essentially the exact same course, just that now we've got a little extra corner to jump over and a boost ramp over the upper portion of the track. Out of all of the 3DS courses that they could have added into 8 via the booster pack, why this one? Using the glider on a level like this just doesn't serve any purpose. And now we have Mario Circuit from the Wii game, yet another track built exactly the same. A basic figure eight, but with a longer tunnel this time. Um, the chain chomp in the middle of the course does add a little bit of interest, but it still leaves much to be desired. I mean, <laughs> what more can I say? You're looking at it, it's vapid and lifeless. And if you've got Mario, then not far behind is Luigi Circuit. This course is actually less interesting structurally, but I'd argue that the shorter laps and the big boost pad hairpin drift on that last turn before the finish line at least make up for it a tiny bit. I mean, this is at least something to look forward to, even if it is underwhelming. It's basic overall, but at least it doesn't outstay its welcome. Up next in this unforgettable race of forgettable Mario Kart tracks is Mushroom Bridge. Now, I don't know if I'm going to cop some flack for this one being so low on the list. I mean, after all, Double Dash holds a place in many people's hearts, but I can honestly say this is one of the most boring levels that I've ever played out of any game. Unlike many others that include pedestrian drivers, I find these other cars don't even become a factor in most races, and while I do enjoy the big Wigglomobile, which isn't in the DS version by the way, this is otherwise just another boring loop. 
There is that little shortcut over the hill, but it doesn't even seem to give you much of an advantage. I swear, it's actually faster to just stay on the main route. It's disappointing, and I'm sorry to the GameCube kids out there, but Double Dash is entering early with two in a row. Peach Beach is another one that I just can't get behind. While at first, the large seaside area with the alternate route might seem like it adds some freedom and variety, it only serves as a distraction from the main race, and being that this area is so wide open, there is very little contact with other drivers, which is kind of the point of these games, right? You want to be in the mix, knocking out other races, but instead you're just bored off your ass. This fountain at the finish line is also dumb and serves no purpose. I mean, if you're already behind and need an item, then taking this path around is only going to hinder your final time. I can't knock the music or the visuals, but at most, it's passable and overall just simply generic. Daisy Hills from Seven only barely scrapes by for offering a large set piece, which is that glide after you climb up through the hills. It's actually quite pretty with all of the balloons and windmills, but this is sadly a mediocre start to another game ripe with strong contenders. The extra pathway down the side into a booster jump is kind of neat I suppose, but that's about all that's here really. It's unfortunate that so many of these early courses for each game are designed to introduce new players, but in my opinion, they actually end up turning away older ones with poor replay value. Every game has them, and I understand why they're included, but they do feel like Nintendo treating every player like children without the brain capacity required for pushing start on the damn title screen. And ending off our bottom 10, let's shift focus now over to the arcade scene with Mario's Beach Cup. Probably most well known as the attract level that is used to make you want to play it in the arcades, appearing in all three versions, jumping in for a race, both of these courses are just a basic loop, but most of the tracks in these arcade games are like this. In both the original and the sequels, the Beach Cup was often home to some of the most vibrant visuals, especially once the sun sets over the horizon, and in Mario Kart Arcade Deluxe, an underwater section was also included in place of the tunnel. But despite their liveliness, they are without question the weakest courses to come out of the arcade titles, which always makes me mad when people pick them to play. I mean, seriously? I had to pay money out of pocket to play this thing the one time a year I'm in the vicinity of the arcade cabinet, and you chose to play Baby's First Mario Kart level? Ah, oh, you little shits. And there you have it folks, the bottom 10 worst courses of the Mario Kart franchise. Most of these aren't necessarily bad per se, but they are quite generic and forgettable. In fact, we've got quite a few levels like that to get through yet, so we'd better get this show on the road. So there's your last chance to go and grab some snacks for the trip ahead, and please, for God's sakes, use the bathroom before we leave, okay? We're not stopping for anything on this two hour road trip and the only thing I have is this empty plastic bottle. So, you've been warned, now let's get into the video. Just avoiding the bottom 10, we have the Cooper Beach courses on Super Nintendo. Man, these were my favourite as a kid given that this was the first Mario Kart that I ever played. Hell, I played this before I even knew what a Mario was. But looking back, they're some of the most basic of locations and wide open with very little happening, much like Peach Beach that we saw a moment ago. For the time though, the presentation offers up some relaxing vibes to break up the gruelling chaos of other courses. And did you know that all of the levels from the Super Nintendo game also appeared as unlockable cups in Super Circuit on the Game Boy Advance? Yeah, I mean sure they're mostly just filler, but I'd say that sums up this level pretty well. Moo Moo Farm is another filler track, if you will. While I enjoy the deep curves in the dirt to drift through and the moles popping up to greet us on the home stretch, this is not a great level, even for the time it first appeared, and honestly, I've got nothing more to say on this one, so let's move up into the snowy mountains for DK Pass. Now this level from the DS game makes me want to pass something through my bowels. Okay, it's not that bad. I just find it quite underwhelming given that Donkey Kong maps and downhill mountain levels often steal the show. But this one disappoints on every front. 
farty, frumpy music, stock snow visuals, and a downhill section completely void of... Well, anything really. I mean, look at this. It's boring. And that sums it all up. Drifting through the turns in the uphill section is this level's only redeeming factor, but I'd rather just move on to the next course, because unlike this level, which is bad for being too safe, Excite Bike Arena is actually a lot of fun despite its simplicity. Yes, Mario Kart 8 entering the list kind of early on, but I mean, for the sheer volume of content it has to offer, that's not a surprise. Anyway, Excite Bike Arena is actually one that I really enjoy playing. Constantly boost jumping off of dirt ramps, bikes tearing through the mud, and a great remix of a classic NES tune. This wouldn't be the quality of Nintendo crossover that we'd come to expect with later inclusions, but this is a great example of modernising a retro concept. In fact, with F-099 tearing things up, Excite Bike 99 could be another good one in the future. There you go, Nintendo. Free idea. Send me a check. Sadly, though, I can't place this level any higher given its incredibly basic layout and otherwise dull atmosphere. There just isn't a lot going on in this one beyond its namesake, and once you realise that, it should be clear why it's being eliminated so early. Alright, let's do another round of knocking out some generic circuits, starting off with Mario Circuit as seen in Double Dash and the Wii's Retro section. Of course, not to be confused with Mario Circuit on the Wii that I've already talked about. Oh, see, that's why we're getting all of these out of the way so early on, because they're all just as interchangeable as the next. This one does, however, stand out just a little bit more than the others for me, given it's got some more pleasant turns all throughout the track and doesn't resort to the overused figure eight design, but that's about all that I can give it credit for. Another double knockout for Double Dash, this time it's Luigi Circuit. Honestly, the only reason this track wasn't included in the bottom 10 is that it's one of the very few examples of a course where you have the potential to cross over with other drivers. The main straightaway overlaps in the middle, which can sometimes provide some funny moments, but I find that they're quite rare and the overall course is just too wide to allow for much interesting gameplay elsewhere. I mean, what's the point of creating a potential crossover point when the odds of direct contact are just so limited? And trumping Luigi Circuit is Luigi Circuit, for God's sake. Super Circuit makes its first official entry into the rankings with this rainy airstrip filled with snaking turns and mud puddles that spin your cart out. For Game Boy Advance, I must say that the faux three-dimensional rain effect makes for an impressive visual and layout-wise, I think that I would actually choose this over some of the other generic circuit courses present here as this feels like a more skill-based event, and playing it in 3D definitely confirms this. Despite system limitations, it attempted to throw a curveball at the generic theme of the franchise, but still, sadly, doesn't have much more to offer us. Now, in similar vein, I've decided to group together both Peach and Mario circuits from this game, as they're incredibly similar to play, near identical thematically, and even their 3D counterparts are virtually interchangeable. But Mario Circuit's inclusion in 8 is what has solidified this spot on the list, given that it adds just a little bit more interest with the anti-gravity hairpin, giving the level some height, and it feels much nicer to cut corners here. Otherwise, it's standard par for the course stuff, but they do get the job done, and as a result, both of these areas together have had a combined appearance across five different games. Both of them originate from Super Circuit on GBA. Peach Circuit appears in the DS title, which was the first to reintroduce us to some of our old favourites. Mario Circuit in both 8 and 8 Deluxe, which, yes, we're counting them as separate entries. And finally, Peach once again returning in tour, which begs the question that if a level that is still this low on the list can appear through half of the franchise's history, then... Which level has made the most appearances out of them all? Well, you're just gonna have to stay tuned to find out. I can tell you one thing though, it's definitely not going to be Frappe Snowland. This is just another boring course with very limited options in terms of shortcuts and opportunities to overtake your opponents. It features no major landmarks and perhaps one decent jump, so... 
This one is a winter write-off that I never look forward to seeing. So let's get out of this snow and head on over to Yoshi Desert, which does very little to improve on quality. In fact, I'll warn you that Mario Kart, in my opinion, doesn't do too well in the desert department and spun its wheels in the sand on more than one occasion. I do love the Yoshi Sphinx in the background and the Oasis stands out as a pretty visual, but otherwise this is just your run-of-the-mill sand trap. Another good example of this is Dry Dry Desert. This one has more potential, but its areas feel disconnected from one another, as no obstacle really feeds into the next. You've got the opening drifts, which then you turn a corner into a giant sinkhole. You've got some dunes to hop over in this super wide area, a key floor in many of Double Dash's locations that we've seen so far, and then a boring straightaway to the finish line. It's not the worst, but it leaves a lot to be desired, I guess. Mario Kart 8 introduced the water section towards the end, but that unfortunately doesn't change a whole lot for me, as I always groan whenever I have to play this track. They should have called it Dull Dull Desert if I'm being completely honest. I'd actually argue, in fact, that Desert Hills from DS has slightly more to offer. Thematically, they're virtually identical, but the layout on this one flows better with some large dune hops and deep winding valleys of which, if you're equipped with some mushrooms, you can boost yourself up and over to gain a serious advantage over the competition, which is a neat little trick. But each replay of this one chips away at its overall value, and had more ideas from the games been incorporated into either of these, then I'd probably have a little more praise to offer. From the scorching heat back to the blistering cold, Snowland from Super Circuit fares just a little better as a super short map, similar to the many Mario's and Luigi's raceways, but the big slippery frozen lake is actually quite enjoyable this time around. In the GBA version, I find this level to be kind of infuriating personally, but its tour and Mario Kart 8 counterparts definitely show that it's not the worst level ever. It's mostly just here to pad out a Grand Prix, which is fine, I guess. I mean, this level is sort of a standard that we expect through a majority of these rankings, which is actually a little odd to me, given that this franchise has proven capable of so much greater things. And I really felt that when I played Water Park for the very first time. Man, this game is gorgeous. Let me just start off with that. It looks so nice, especially any levels that have water in them. I could honestly drink it, slurp it all up. But aside from the basic anti-grav loop section, the rest of this place doesn't feel very inspired, which for the eighth game in a long-running series, you might expect that. But I also expect this game to be burning on all cylinders to deliver banger after banger, which it does do, this just obviously isn't one of them. <laughs> Luigi Raceway is up next, and this was the very first sight we ever got of Mario Kart in 3D, which at the time was a groundbreaking concept. With swooping turns and tunnels, this felt like a legitimate race course, and with fans in attendance watching on the big screen, made this one such a big deal. Of course, looking back on it now, there isn't a lot to really see here, though I still managed to squeeze some fun out of it from time to time. It's a nice track, but like many of its counterparts, best remembered and not so much replayed. I feel the same about Sweet Sweet Canyon. Thinking back to my first time playing number 8, I really enjoyed this one, but coming back to it over the years, the plate looks a little empty. This canyon begins with a huge launch above this fantastic lake area and into a long drift, which then splits the track leading up and under, over and around. The yellow fountain is something else though. I mean, thank god we're not in a snow level. I love the gingerbread men in the stands and all of the snacky visuals, but that final corner? Man, the amount of times that I get cut off from a victory here is astounding. Even when I attempt to make it myself, my broke-ass Mario Kart skills start to creep through, but regardless, I just find this one to be lacking on the layout side for a theme that has the potential to go above the normal limits. From one sugary snack to another, we've got Sky High Sunday from Tour, which is now a nice little addition to 8 Deluxe on the Switch. 
Despite being a basic circle, this one actually has a little more going on with some much bigger jumps, amusing corners to drift, and it's disgustingly sickly visuals. I mean, oh my god, just look at these side by side. The pristine and refined Mario Kart 8, and the blocky, plastic looking tour design. Man, no wonder people's teeth fell out over the jarring visual differences for many of the tracks featured in the booster pack. This level is okay, but there were much better short form courses. Swinging back over to the arcade titles again, one of them is the DK Cup. The first track, DK Jungle, is merely a basic loop similar to Baby Park and Excite Bike, but this is eight laps of intense racing, let me tell you, opening up to the surrounding Bananan Ruins as the rain begins to pour down adds a lot more visual interest, and while it doesn't exactly scream Donkey Kong, I can't deny the incredible bouncy soundtrack. However, while this cup was originally owned by Donkey Kong for the first two arcade entries, he would sadly hand the title over to Don Chan of the Taiku no Tatsujin Rhythm Game franchise. Yeah, these arcade titles were handed by Namco, hence the inclusion of Pac-Man and some other Namco properties. While still the same basic courses, I actually find it really refreshing to see another crossover stylized course, especially one outside of Nintendo's general reach. Visually and audibly, I much prefer this version, as it's something fresh for the franchise. It's actually a crime that they're just basic reskins of levels that do still manage to be fun, but are ultimately nothing more than a basic loop. And from one basic loop to probably the most iconic and noteworthy of the franchise, it's Baby Park Time. This seven lap special is pure, uncontested chaos at its finest, with items flying everywhere, races on a variety of different laps at any given time, and with that bubbly, psychotic music playing, this is an insane time, especially in multiplayer. And people love it, right? I mean, so far, it's the only standalone level that has appeared up to five times throughout the years, but for as entertaining and fruity as this one might be, there is no denying that this is a weak course. Presentation and everything else is up to par, and the gameplay is what sells this one, but I feel that the gameplay is only the way it is because of an otherwise stupid and lazy design. There, I said it. This is stupid. Sure, it's the best kind of stupid. I mean, I always have fun with it, but in good conscience, I can't place it any higher than this, I'm sorry, as despite the hectic pleasure that it can offer, the novelty wears off very quickly with every additional replay. Moo Moo moving on to Moo Moo Meadows now. This simple yet memorable Wii course offers a basic cross-country circuit through fields covered in annoying cows and this large patchy area with a fun jump towards the end. Obviously, the visual clarity and remastered graphics of the version which appears in 8 blows the original out of the water and also offers an extra jump on the side. Definitely the superior of the two farm courses in the series, but I still don't think that this theme really had that much to offer to begin with. Next up, we have a level that actually really disappointed me. While I'm glad to see Yoshi's Island get some representation with its friendly enemy designs, great music, and even its very own special little details exclusive to this course, I find that the track drastically underperforms. I mean, nothing really sets this one apart from a lot of the other middle-of-the-pack tracks that we're seeing now, which is not something that I should be saying for one of the franchise's most adventurous titles. I do like the cloud section, and if you or another racer is able to trigger the bonus pathway towards the finish line, then there is some interactive elements not too common in many other levels, but the biggest missed opportunity here is the visuals. If there was ever a time to break out the colourful, crayon-drawn graphics, this was it. 
We can't use technical limitations as an excuse here, as we're on the Switch, and even then, some tour levels have more detailed visuals than this. So without that distinct Yoshi's Island style, then what's the point? And as a result, this level loses some really crucial points from me, because I should be gushing over a Mario Kart course in this theme. It's a damn shame. I mean, otherwise, it's fine. I'm just upset because I expected much better when I first sat down to play this one. And one of the reasons that I expected better is because the Yoshi Park Cup from Grand Prix 2 featured some of these colouring book items on the map. Look at this, it's like riding through a pop-up book, and I think it's super cute. It's nice and colourful, plenty of set pieces as well. I wish I could just slow down and take everything in, and unlike other arcade loops, this track is a straight course that teleports you back to the start, meaning that there is less technical driving and more of a reliance on the use of your items to win. Hence, it can be a bit boring to play because of that. But yeah, it's crazy to me that the arcade games were able to represent Yoshi's Island better than Mario Kart 8, which is supposed to be the penultimate MK experience. Sadly, this course layout would be handed over to Toad in GP Deluxe and swapped over to the more generic Mushroom Kingdom theming with the pipes and the grassy hills, but we do still have a brief pop-up book section in there, so while the overall theme may be gone, it's not forgotten. It's really interesting seeing how some of these arcade levels compare to what most people would consider to be the, the truer example of a Mario Kart game. Um, but as we continue on now, if you're enjoying the video, then maybe consider subscribing and sharing it with a friend, as that really helps me to grow this channel and keep on top of bigger projects like this one, because, trust me when I say, splitting hairs over which generic track is better than the next is no easy feat. So let's keep doing just that and knock out a few more basic entry level maps. Cheap Cheap Lagoon, or Cheap Cheap Cape as it's known in some regions, is your simple yet satisfying water circuit, diving down under to steal from clams and then rising out into quite a pretty cave area. I really like this. You've got the main path back down into the water or the side track which lets you get a boost past the stalactites on the ceiling. This one is just simply nice, even if there is little that I can do to articulate it. Another cheap, cheap level now, this time it's Island from Super Circuit, along with its alternative, Shy Guy Beach, are a revision on the classic beach maps from the Super Nintendo days. Generally going for the same aesthetic, but with more going on in the background, including pirate ships and some big fellas jumping out of the water, along with the additional boardwalk sections, are a nice touch. It's just a shame that these different elements don't play into the actual structure of the level more by providing us with unique hazards. These are standard setting tracks from what you might at first glance consider to be one of the weaker entries, but in fact, Super Circuit is one of the most enjoyable and ultra replayable games in this series to this day. I still take it out with me and play from time to time while waiting for the train. The simplicity, the retro throwback and the sweet tunes are a big seller for me, so if you haven't actually given this one a fair chance in the past, well, you probably should as there are still plenty of quality courses still to come from this game. You know, Mario Raceway from 64 is actually a pretty neat track, as it features a few decent corners, straightaways with jumps off to the side, and I also enjoy the large pipe tunnel. It's just as generic as the rest, yet, I don't know, this one speaks to me a lot more than most others within its genre. I feel like, especially playing on the Wii, if you're using motion controls and the Wii wheel, it's a great map to practice on, and on that note, it's actually higher on the list than the Wii's own original circuit maps, which is pretty funny to me. Mario Circuit from DS feels like a nice evolution on this with a more interesting layout while still including features such as the pipe tunnel and the dusty piranha plant infested gardens from Double Dash. But it also features this forest setting towards the back which is a nice visual change of pace from everything else and also some nasty hairpins to liven up the otherwise child friendly layout with some more skill based challenge being introduced finally. It was fun on the DS, it's great to play on the Switch actually 
actually, and definitely a good entry point to the middle section of the rankings, taking a look at many of the tracks which may not blow your mind away, but definitely do help to build up that impressive foundation which has kept the series so strong over all these years. I remember the first time I saw Mario Kart Stadium advertised when 8 was due for release on the Wii U and just being so excited like a little kid even though I didn't even have the system. It doesn't matter if it's the basic beginner's course, so what? It's still really enjoyable and sold the anti-gravity gimmick quite well while looking absolutely stunning in the process. I mean, just to see how far these games have grown visually over the years and how, despite all of the advances and missteps we make as a society, that we still always have the carefree pastime of Mario Kart to fall back on. This is a level that is good on its own, but best in my opinion as a feeling, you know. That feeling that you can only get from drifting with Plumber Boy and storming across the finish line after a hotly contested race. Daisy Circuit from Wii is another great example of that feeling that you only get with kart races. The cartoony visuals, vibrant music, and a solid course design. This one is on the streets, cutting corners up over curbs, back alleys into hidden boost ramps, and I love the tunnel section. They weren't lying when they said that it was dangerous in here. Those green shells, man, they're the bane of my existence. The coastal sunset as the road swirls into some large drifts back around the lighthouse point and along the main shoreside area makes for an integral location to gain your advantage or lose the race entirely. I wasn't expecting to see this one added in to number 8, but it's a welcome addition for sure, especially with those extra boost pads on that lighthouse turn which light up the asphalt even more with some blistering speed. Also featured in the Wii game as a retro course from the classic N64 title is Sherbet Land, an improvement over Frappe Snowland with a more interesting design circling the frozen lake with great walls of ice and chilly caves to drift through. It can be a bit wide open in some areas for my liking, leaving it feeling a little bit dead, but it's still a more cheerful time with that nice song and all of the little newt newts sliding around. I don't know what it is about lap 2 though, but it always has me sinking in the drink. I'm like the Titanic, just try to keep me out of the water. Another 64 classic is Choco Mountain with its poop emoji tunnel and gnarly corners. This map isn't much to look at in my opinion, and that song is really annoying, but gameplay wise, it stands out for the hazards you encounter. You've got the boulder avalanche collapsing down onto you of course, but then there is also the dastardly corners with steep slippery edges, and if you're unlucky to get hit with an item or misjudge your turn, it can send you plummeting right back down below, costing you or an unlucky opponent the entire race on the final turn. But if you manage to hit it just right, then your reward is some big booster jumps into the finish line. So as a genuine fan of these finer finicky details, I actually despise the remaster. I am not happy that they took the challenge out of this corner with a huge barrier. It's a real shame if you ask me. Like I understand it for Tor, which doesn't have traditional controls, but in Tour, you're also completely ignoring the original intent for this level anyway, so for number 8, why on earth would you cut the balls off of this good level? Similarly, Sunset Wilds was also butchered in the remakes. If you're unfamiliar, the Game Boy Advance original was a sprint through Monument Valley, and while this is a pretty stock standard track, it's the visuals that impressed me the most the first time I played it. Over the course of three laps, we see the sun slowly set and then blossom into a sparkling night sky. That detail alone really helped this to stand out, as there aren't many courses I could name that do anything similar to this. Unfortunately though, in my short time playing Tour, I learned that we only get two phases of the sunset due to the shorter lap count. So imagine my despair when I played this in Deluxe and there was no sunset in Sunset Wilds! Now, Nintendo might fix this at some point, but as it stands at the time of making this video, Mario Kart 8 on the Switch is eating the dust of its 16-bit grandfather. <laughs> How embarrassing. If you're not going to treat it with respect, then just leave it alone. 
On the other hand, a level that does get the nighttime vibes right is Shy Guy Bazaar. Set in a desert town marketplace, curving around market stalls, jumping up on top for an advantage and the like, it's a good time and with some good turns and simple, yet effective alleyways to discover, I wish this level lasted a bit longer. It's a very brief circuit sadly, but for what it is, the foundations of a great level are here, it just doesn't fully deliver unfortunately. Especially seeing how well Tour would deliver on many of its real world inspired city courses, leaves me feeling like a lot more could have been achieved here to elevate this experience beyond a missed opportunity. For a Super Nintendo course, Choco Island 1 and 2 are actually a lot of fun. Just the right amount of swooping turns, the mud is joyous to splash through, and the game has both speed boosts and the feather item to make navigation a little bit easier. DS brought this theme into 3D and showed that it's still just as fun as ever, while Tour actually made some further improvements with the additional dirt ramps, which is good to see. Still, not the best SNES level, but you might be surprised that some have even made it this far. Seriously man, these are good levels. The original game is still a pleasure all these years later, and the constant remasters throughout the years prove that Nintendo struck gold with the original Kart Racer back in 1992. Here we have another middle ground what is there to say about it kind of level in Merry Mountain, a Christmas themed stage. Irrelevant and out of place 11 months out of the year, and overexposed to nausea the other month. It does offer a fun mountain climb taking either the track or the beaten up railway, climbing the snow to a wicked half pipe before zooming back down the hill to the finish is a celebration. This one just doesn't really stand out beyond it just being a nice novelty to see Mario Kart take on this theme both visually with the warm lighting and with that pretty song to match it. I mean, just have a listen. Alright, let's knock out another arcade course. As I mentioned earlier, the collaboration with Namco led to some of their characters being playable in these games. None more famous than Pac-Man who got his own two levels. Now this is really neat. I mean, firstly, Pac-Man should have been in more Mario Karts. He's just the perfect fit. But while this level is more involved than some others with bigger turns and tunnels and whatnot, it doesn't really look like Pac-Man, does it? Well, not to me it doesn't. I'm sure this is set in the Pac-Man World Games universe, but it doesn't exactly scream the iconic imagery that you'd expect. Thankfully, the alternate track is split into two different areas, with the second part seeing you warp into the classic tunnels with ghosts and whatnot in the background. But it's still kinda lame, I'm not gonna lie. It almost looks like this was an afterthought, which, for at the time, was a huge debut for the Mario Kart franchise, simply doesn't deliver as it should have for me. Cloud Top Cruise from 8 is, in my opinion, mostly remembered for its galaxy-inspired music rather than its less-inspired visuals. I mean, honestly, this is just a poor man's sky garden. While I do enjoy the Thunder Tunnel and you get that electric guitar kick in on the soundtrack, that's the course done and finished, all but for a risky yet sneaky skip past that final corner. I'd forgotten that this level even included any floating airships, as it's such an underutilized feature, despite being one of Mario's most iconic throughout the years. We should be launching through the sky, jumping from one ship to the next and avoiding cannon fire, not just slipping around on an old beanstalk. I'm sorry if you're a fan of this one, I can see why some people would enjoy it, but this just doesn't do it for me. The perfect example of what I'm talking about, and some tracks that do this just right, is Bowser Jr's Cup from Grand Prix Deluxe. 
See, look at this. It's got plenty of airships, cloudy transitions, cannons firing everywhere, and we even get down to the nitty-gritty interior workings of the structures. It looks great, has a solid soundtrack, and is definitely one of the more noteworthy courses to come out of this game. So, why isn't it higher up on the list? Well, sadly, this cup was adapted from the Waluigi Cup from the previous arcade game. While the theming is totally different, these course layouts are virtually identical, so I'm afraid that I'm going to have to write this off as a remaster and not its own unique level. As a result, the less than inspired stadium theming with next to no interesting obstacles or landmarks really holds this one back, which is a damn shame if you ask me. If Nintendo weren't so scared of progress, then we could have seen both Aerial Road and Sky Arena combined into one to create a really fun, memorable, and truly unique level in 8, or possibly even Tour. But sadly, without that, this potential is forever trapped as an arcade exclusive. Did it. Did it. From one pure exclusive to the next, this time it's Piranha Plant Pipeline, which is the only remaining level from Tour not to be ported over into Mario Kart 8. Honestly, I'm pretty shocked by that. Must be some poor last ditch effort to get people to download the game just to try it and see what they're missing out on, or more likely, it's just to avoid confusion with some other, much more impressive stages. But regardless, this level being exclusive to a mobile game with a constantly rotating availability on all of its levels, I fear that one day, this entry could end up being lost media, but Thankfully, you can find mods which put the map into 8 if you really wanted to try it out. However, I'm not going to take that into consideration while ranking this one. Anyway, as for the level itself, you can probably see it looks pretty basic. The entire thing takes place through the tubes, which should make for some decent drifting akin to, I don't know, sewer speedway from Crash Team Racing, but... Eh, yeah, I wouldn't trust the touchscreen controls to deliver that feeling, and as a result, it's just an uneventful map otherwise. It's got a nice split section and the bright visuals to compensate, but otherwise, Piranha Plant Pipeline is pretty passable. In fact, now that I'm seeing it, I'm actually kind of glad that this one was excluded from the booster pack. Oh, we're making serious grounds towards the top 100 now, so in classic Jack fashion, let's knock out a few more fan favourites before we get there. Yoshi Falls is honestly a really entertaining loop. The decision of taking the higher ground for safety or gaining an advantage on the lower level for items and speed boosts is quite thrilling. The reason that this very simple one has made it up a lot higher than the likes of Baby Park is simply for that strategy alone and the risk versus reward on what is otherwise just another beginner track. But I do wish that Yoshi Falls went beyond the 3 lap standard, maybe up to 5, just to increase the chances for more chaotic moments. Another one which screams unrealised potential to me. Mushroom Gorge, on the other hand, feels like it's ripe with chaotic moments when you're bouncing on those damn mushrooms, but beyond that, I can't see why people love this one so much. Maybe it's childhood nostalgia, I don't know. I mean, don't get me wrong, it's a fine level, but nothing really all that special in the grand scheme of things, and the decision to have a split in the path that actually takes longer than the more obvious route for very little reward gives me Peach Beach vibes. It's a good track, a standard setter, but not much else beyond that. And just as I reference Double Dash, next up is Daisy Cruiser, another memorable, iconic level just missing out on a top 100 position. It's a great concept for a level theme, but execution-wise is better in some other games. I mean, it checks everything off of the list from the top deck with the pool, the lower boiler room section, but the only actually good set piece is the dining room with all of the tables and chairs swaying around on the tide. Oh, and when you launch up out from the lowest floor, Daisy Cruiser accidentally turns into Daisy Upskirt. 
I think that later revisions did the best that they could by incorporating a new split in the path and allowing you to actually enter the pool thanks to the submarine mechanics, but there is just still too many dull points on this map where not a lot can or will ever happen, which for such a short one should always have some action happening on screen. Another GameCube level, this time it's the exclusive known as Mushroom City, which attempts something a little bit different. Starting up on the freeway and working your way below to the downtown streets, we're spoiled for choice when it comes to different routes to take. I really like this, you've actually got a bit of freedom here and there are plenty of little shortcuts and secrets to take advantage of. The downside however is that races are more often separated which results in less action once again. Either you're driving empty roads completely alone, or you're getting bombarded by every cart all at once when they meet up again. I think the downtown section would have made for a much more appropriate battle arena than anything else, but even then, I'm afraid that the experimental aspects of this one just can't help to hide that there isn't much else to see here. In my opinion, Mushroom City was ahead of its time because when you look at the different city sprints that we got from Tour and the way that they all loop into each other and explore different routes across three laps, showcases that they were onto something with this back in the day. But failing to bank on that concept in the original leaves it in the dust of its successes. Contrary to that, however, Neo Bowser City, or just plainly Koopa City in power regions, has too much going on for my liking. Look, I'll start off with this. Theme-wise, I really like this level. The techno-futuristic city, the layout of the course in theory provides a lot of challenge and requires technical skill and ability, but ultimately, what this level comes down to for me is frustration and difficulty for all of the wrong reasons. Debuting in Mario Kart 7 on 3DS, it just feels slippery, and I think it's the rain. I think the wet road actually makes you slip and slide all over the place, which might be able to work. I mean, that works fine for all of the ice levels, so why doesn't it make sense here? Because this layout is already tough enough without the addition of obscure cart controls, I just can't get the hang of it. Even when I select easier characters with more turning based stats, it still doesn't help. This triple hairpin in the middle is something that I'd feel more comfortable tackling in Crash Team Racing with its advanced drifting controls, not Mario Kart. And the big boost before the finish line has the potential to cripple your position in the race. Thankfully, this was revised in 8, and it no longer seems to be as slippery either, thank god, so I can see now what the appeal is, but even then, this is still a very tough level to get the hang of. One that I don't think gels with Mario Kart's controls super well, but hey, if you can master this one, then you'll be unstoppable in online races, that's for sure. Both of these city courses tried something different, but ultimately got a little lost in their own concepts. So stripping this concept back to its foundation reveals that Toad's Turnpike, despite its basic figure eight structure, can provide just as much fun and at a balanced difficulty. Your main opponent here is the oncoming traffic, as well as just dragging on a bit long if you're playing the original, but in 8, thanks to decades of evolution, Turnpike now offers a lot of variety allowing for wall rides, navigating the traffic more precisely, or hell, just using the traffic to your advantage. It's a very solid map, a template if you will, which has since been referenced countless times throughout the years. I guess this one is lacking mostly due to the theme being kind of generic and not very Mario or even Mario adjacent. Its strengths lie in competitive racing which wasn't fully realised until the remaster in 8, creating quite a wide gap in quality over the years. For number 102, we've got Paris Promenade, the first on a strong list of city courses in this race around the world, the real world for a change as opposed to the Mario universe, which often crosses over into the real world, I don't know, just, just blame it all on time travel I suppose. 
If you're unfamiliar, in order to inflate the amount of content for the mobile game, many levels from Tour would feature multiple variants, remixes and reverse races which in Mario Kart 8 have all been condensed down into a single track to create some truly unique scenes. While this may be the first to get ported over and the first appearing in the rankings, that doesn't make it the lowest in terms of inventive concepts. There are alternate routes here, shortcuts to take if you've got a hold of the right items, and for the final lap, everything loops back onto itself and into oncoming traffic. The monuments and set pieces aside, this is a well-made track, but I can see why Nintendo opted for this level to be the introduction of this new idea that the tour levels introduced, as it really sells this concept without overstepping any expectations. Woo! Alright, time for our very first Rainbow Road of the rankings. It's going to be difficult to pick a number one out of these, but out of nine possible entries, the first and most obvious choice to appear is the Rainbow Coaster Part 1 and 2 from the arcade titles. Offering the toughest challenge in these games by far, with twisting bends and long downhill segments, I've decided to play as Mamechi from the Tamagotchi franchise for this one, as unlike Pac-Man, there were no special cups designed specifically for them. So they get Rainbow Road all to themselves, and these are just so lovable and cute. I'm disappointed they were removed from the most current arcade titles, so you can't really play these ones anymore without emulation or an old physical release, and good luck with that. It's a shame because visually they're striking, like all of these tracks, and the level music is like no other Rainbow Road. Just check it out. Gorgeous, I absolutely love that. This might not be the most famous Rainbow Road, but it's definitely still a great time at number 101, and I feel like the perfect way to end off this leg of the race. And that, my friends, brings us to the top 100 Mario Kart levels. Let me know with a comment down below if any of your picks have already been eliminated in the early stages of this video. I do think it's worth noting, though, that Compared to some of the other every level ranked videos that I've completed in the past, where we'd still be in the absolute dregs of mediocrity at this point, Mario Kart on the other hand is already beginning to deliver us some very memorable courses that have stood the test of time. But which of these levels will be number 100? And now, a quick message from today's sponsor, Patreon. If you like what you see here on the channel, it's all thanks to the support of our incredible community over on Patreon. By pledging, you are directly helping me to keep content flowing, and you'll also unlock rewards from regular updates about the channel, early access to new videos, as well as some Patreon-exclusive content with every new upload. Patreon is the only place to see me building Mario Kart sets, playing Fortnite, baking cookies, and a whole lot more. So, link is in the description. Cheers, guys. On to another long distance Grand Prix. This time we're scaling the gorgeous Woohoo Island in MK7 on the 3DS. Now this is cool, I like this inclusion. For all the fun I had racing around in the Wii Fit games and exploring the island on foot and on Segway, nothing beats a kart race around the stunning vistas and hillsides. We've got two versions I'm grouping together here, the island loop around the outside of the map, crossing that iconic bridge, the lighthouse and through Woohoo Town. Then the climb up through to the top of Makawuhu Rocky Peak at sunset is also a welcome alternative that is capped off greatly by a tremendous glide back down to the beachside area. Out of these two courses, I find the former to feature the most interesting gameplay with more optional routes and some dastardly shortcuts for the win. It comes across a little generic maybe, but I can appreciate Nintendo incorporating more of their history into the franchise. 
Sherbet Land is much like all of the other ice courses we've previously seen and doesn't do a lot to really set itself apart from the crowd, so I had planned to place this one a bit lower, but thankfully in number 8 it's been given a fresh coat of paint and a clearer identity. No longer does falling down the ice sink your cart, instead giving you a second chance to race underwater and recover. It can lead to new shortcuts that weren't available previously, and while there may still be a few much better executed snow scenes from the franchise, we've definitely come a long way since this garbage. Next up, we've got a decent and memorable little circuit level, which is Mario Circuit on the 3DS, thanks to one key feature. We've seen how many of these types of levels over the years, and this is the first to actually make use of Princess Peach's castle and incorporates it into the track's design. Even just for a simple upward helix turn, boosting out into a field of pipes, then riding the walls and getting air out the other side, I can still appreciate that they're trying to get as much as they can out of this setting. Uh, sure, it's a simple one with a theme that I'm sick of talking about at this point, but I think this level is pretty solid and I can't recall a bad race that I've had on it with my time playing. Now this is a level that was new to me playing through the franchise in preparation for this video. I never had a DS system growing up so I'd never played the original and while I have spent some time with Mario Kart Wii in its prime, I'm sure I must have played this at some point but I simply had no recollection of this track and so to my surprise Delfino Square delivers a compact combative spectacle through tight winding streets. While the grey stone walls don't exactly depict the bright and colourful imagery of sunshine that I'm familiar with, layout wise this makes for an interesting drag race. Alleyways split, it's got 90 degree turns and wide open spaces to help make your move. I absolutely love this shortcut jumping across the river towards the pier, even if I am completely shit at it. It's creative and a must learn if you want to play competitively. And then there is me, totally blind to what this level has to offer, thinking I'm being cunning and sly by taking a different shortcut cut only to get stuck in the damn mud. God, I am an idiot. Beyond exposing my mediocre skills at these games, Delfino Square is really solid and a track that I definitely won't be forgetting anytime soon. Alright, time for another desert course. Man, we haven't had one of these for a while now, so let's get dusty in dry, dry ruins. As you can see, some familiar set pieces now fully realised in three dimensions, and for once, we have a scorcher of a level with things actually happening. Fun drifting turns, makeshift jumps for extra boosts, temple interiors and half pipes, all of the makings of a long-lasting, forever replayable course. I don't have a lot more to say on this one, other than the fact that I'm just really happy to see a strong entry for this theme, and thankfully, it's not the last one either. It took some trial and error, but they finally figured out this whole desert thing. In similar fashion, Bone Dry Dunes ticks a lot of the same boxes, tightening its corners even further and extending beyond the dusty plains up onto the desolate remains of some giant creature into a big glide towards the finish. There's lots of nice visuals too, such as the airship surfing on the waves of sand. <laughs> Truly iconic. Now, personally, I find this one can be somewhat challenging due to the stricter turning, but it's still very much an enjoyable time, and a level which is fun at both casual and competitive levels of play. But it's not overcomplicated either. It almost feels like a throwback to a simpler time within the franchise. H hang on, what's that noise? Uh-oh, get ready for some serious hell, because it's finally time to talk about Bowser's Castle. Yeah, you want to talk about difficult turns and competitive challenge, then look no further than the original source of childhood nightmares. I've seen some discourse recently about the poorly thought out structure of these raceways, specifically Bowser Castle 2 having a dead end, which leads into a lava pit, awful square turns and shortcuts that don't naturally flow with the rest of the level, and yeah, I get it. It's tough. Even with the right items to combat these hazards, timing is still brutal, and to be completely honest, I can't recall that I've ever done it successfully. But it's not all that bad. Both Castle 1 and 3 are iconic and while still a considerable leap in challenge compared to everything else in the game, offer a nerve-wracking race through a fortress of freaking insane karting action. 
But still, for the longest time, these levels were hindered by the fact that they only appeared in the 2D titles of the series, which, in many fans' minds, seemed to deem them as inferior or just too difficult to play. And I would agree on that point. In fact, I'd originally planned for this overall set of tracks to appear closer to around the 130 mark until the third map was remastered in 3D for Tour and later added into 8 Deluxe on the Switch. Finally, we can see after 30 odd years the potential this otherwise simple looking map now had to offer. With an interesting warp design to its architecture, actual physical structure with clearer borders, and most importantly, clean, refined control. This has proven the original Bowser's Castle worthy of the top 100, and while still the very first Bowser level to be eliminated from the series, a strong introduction to one of the most memorable and key Mario Kart themes, and finally realising its full potential, saved itself from a a much harsher ranking. Seriously, if you haven't tried this one yet, then you need to get on it because it's frantic. You've got jumps and obstacles everywhere, climbing up that big wall is a thrill, and then you've got this section with all these high up ledges which don't really serve much purpose, but they're just so funky. I love it. And oh my god, that badass song remix, one for the ages. Shifting gears now, let's shred up another tour level. This time it's the Royal Raceway known as London Loop. This jaunt through the winding streets of Westminster past Big Benjamin and through double-decker traffic, across Tower Bridge and through St James's Park, there are so many references to historical landmarks here. Even the British standard for dental work is represented, with a race that takes us all across the city in another decent street course. But again, this is one of the weaker of the tour set, in my opinion. Uh, it, it has more going on than Paris Promenade with its more diverse layout and set pieces, but sadly feels more like a scripted tourism advertisement than a well-constructed Mario Kart level. It does get the job done, but it's far from the king of kart racing. Heading down below the loop is another loop in Super Bell Subway. This is a neat evolution on some of the other maps which feature traffic, trapping us in a claustrophobic tunnel with a large train and sharing the tracks with all of the other drivers in hot competition. It's not much to look at, but the abundance of alternative roads, high or low, help to make each lap feel dynamic and unique. More of a technical course, but one less memorable than others, I would say. A good level in passing, but never one that I opt into playing, personally. In at number 91, we've got Yoshi Valley from 64. An interesting map like no other. Spoiled for choice, but which path is the quickest? You're just gonna have to experiment and find out. It's cool, I like it, though looking at how the original plays today, I am less impressed than when I first saw the level years ago. Thankfully, the remaster in 8 does the job much better thanks to cleaner presentation, but as a result, lacks the, lacks the ominous feeling, I guess. I enjoy not being shown the position of each racer in the original, whereas it creates a constant sense of urgency even in first place as you can't be sure on which drivers are close behind you. But now you can clearly see your standing and the HD graphics give it a lot more structure but also lead it to feel a bit more generic I guess. Still though, as a retro restoration in 8, it's still a solid addition to the lineup and as for its appearance in tour, getting to play the track in reverse was like a whole new map entirely. It really invigorated it with some new life. And speaking of Mario Kart 8, we've got another Rainbow Road getting knocked out kind of early. 
To be completely honest with all of you, I don't know if I'm going to be backed up or completely alone on this take, but I find this Rainbow Road particularly underwhelming. Now to be clear, yes, this is still a well thought out track with memorable set pieces and the challenge you expect from a course in this theme, but despite all of that, I find it generally comes across as a little tired. Instead of the actual rainbow track, it takes place on a group of space stations and satellites, but unfortunately, moving between them is sometimes automated. A big detractor from many great rainbow roads, unfortunately. Plus, the anti-grav gimmick feels needlessly thrown in for the sake of it rather than a thought-out feature, which also strips a lot of the challenge and spectacle away. I just simply don't get excited to play it, and I'm sure that many will disagree with that, but I think there are countless better options, and hopefully, when the day comes we finally get Mario Kart 9, I just hope that Nintendo won't just squiggle a bunch of roads together for the sake of having something purposefully complicated. That's my biggest gripe with this one, is that it just doesn't flow like these levels should. For 89, we've got another damn circuit level, but this time it's Mario Circuit 8, and this one hits different. The infinity symbol is appropriate for this one because I could race this thing forever. A large figure 8 that turns upside down onto itself, granting you an anti-gravity course like no other in a simple yet very creative way. This is a defining track of the franchise, hence why it was on the cover of Mario Kart 8 when it first released. Given the branding for these games, the anti-grav and the underwhelming reception to this game's Rainbow Road, I'd have actually loved to have seen this map as THE Rainbow Road for 8 because, well as we'll learn later on in the video, the simpler Rainbow Roads are often the strongest, and in this case, not even that iconic imagery can defeat simplicity executed to a record standard. I feel like in any other kart racing game, this level would potentially place up even higher in the rankings, but because it's Mario Kart that we're discussing, we've still got a lot of great courses left to race yet. One of them is the GBA Classic Riverside Park and Lakeside Park. Filled with sidewinding jungle turns, water hazards, and at times, even a volcano erupting. I think the most memorable thing about either of these tracks is that damn turn on Lakeside where if you drift too wide, you'll accidentally slip over the barrier and miss the big booster jump, forcing you to have to complete the corner again. It's a damn beginner's trap. Hell, I know that it's there and I still have to double check myself on every lap. It's odd that they opted for the less interesting of the two for a remaster, but I do still enjoy seeing this one in HD, ending with another upward helix and out through a waterfall to the finish line. Back on the N64, one of the most memorable tracks was Calamari Desert, a simple course in the game's opening cup, but one that stands out for a single reason. The train. Halting traffic, causing drivers to get displaced and gain huge advantages or fall behind to a point that it's impossible to break free, the difficulty from this one purely stems from the forced segregation of the drivers, which I'm sure for most isn't exactly a fun concept. As the games got faster over the years, the train became less of an issue thanks to additional jumps and shortcuts and even in its most recent state, sending players headfirst down the tracks themselves. I love this version of Calamari the most, and it's nice to see some of our classic faves evolve to find fresh life in the newer games with a bigger focus on the player experience, as it should be. But in doing so, it's that double-edged sword costing it of the core feature, to some extent, not all of it. <laughs> Evolve is exactly what Nintendo did for Bowser's Castle in Super Circuit. Taking everything that made the Super NES castles both tough and lively, the GBA shifted this theme into overdrive with more chaotic turns, thwomps everywhere, and plenty of deadly jumps. Being 2D, it can still be difficult at times to define edges as you boost your way down the tight straightaways, but thankfully, these levels were shown a little more appreciation and reappeared multiple times. Playing this set all leveled up makes these hot tracks feel even hotter, but I don't want to discredit the originals as strong in their own right thanks to the tighter controls and better flow in Super Circuit. 
Out of all four of these variations, I find four to be the most satisfying to master, but even though these are all collectively more solid overall, I do wish we could have seen more detail added in to their remasters. So while this group of levels may be superior to the Super Nintendo castles, Bowser Castle 3 is still the best one so far. On to a simpler concept now, another beach course. Cheap Cheap Beach from Mario Kart DS is a marriage of all of the previous iterations of this type, thanks to the giant rock formations, sandbars out over the water, some jungle to spice things up, and those huts along the wooden boardwalks. But also, for the first time ever in the remaster, we can dive down below to take the fastest route possible to the finish line and tighten up the competition. This one might be a little bit elementary, but it's simply gorgeous to visit, and always a nice change of pace. We're creeping up quickly on the halfway mark now, and while I'm a little upset that some of these next tracks missed out on being, you know, in the above average section of the video, there is no denying that all of these are still highly beloved courses. Cooper Cape, as seen in Wii, 7, Tour, and 8's Deluxe Booster Pack DLC, we've got a tall mountain range that climbs up into a half-pipe turn directly into a flowing river. Drive with that current to gain some extra speed and watch for some tricks corners before diving deep under into a submerged tunnel below sea level. This is a great landmark for a level, experienced at its best in the original Wii version I feel, as this version is actually a tubular tunnel, whereas later revisions would incorporate the submarine water physics and then anti-gravity, as the track is now totally exposed to the elements. I feel like this detail misses the briefing on what's fun about this track in the first place. It's unique for this feature, so I'm sad that they've messed it up in recent attempts. Still a great one though, providing some good, fair challenge and plenty of opportunities to be a little bastard with your friends. BOO! It's Luigi time, baby! Luigi's Mansion is the perfect setting for a Mario Kart track, as there has always been a creepy presence in the franchise. Funnily enough though, the mansion is maybe the least interesting part for me. As much as I enjoy the downward spiral, we're back out into the gardens before you know it being confronted by possessed trees, slipping around in the muddy back roads, and throwing out whatever you've got as a last ditch effort to maintain your lead before hitting the finish line. That's fine, but I thought the entire point of Luigi's Mansion is exploring the mansion. So why do we get to see such a limited amount here? I mean, this could have been a multi-level madness of stairways, attacking other players and haunted bedrooms, and while it is still an alright, uh, you know, spooky sort of level, there is no denying that it is one of the weakest in this genre. Of course, it's hard to top such a strong original, and the Ghost Valley levels from the original Kart Racer are still some of my favourites after all these years. I remember being a kid and seeing these for the first time and being genuinely terrified of the tonal shift from the happy, bouncy 16-bit graphics and music to the cold and dark, gloomy race course accompanied by that nefarious soundtrack. It's scary, man. There's g g g ghosts. I suck at these too, even as an adult. I've just never got good at hitting some of these turns. I must admit that I find the atmosphere a little lost in the Wii remake. It just doesn't hit the same for me, especially with the tighter controls, losing some of that intimidation factor. Thankfully, Banshee Boardwalk from 64 took this theme and introduced it to 3D quite faithfully, though the walkways are a little more forgiving this time around. The boos, however... No, they're much more of a problem. If you're holding onto an item, you'd better watch out because they love to steal them. And I love the additional burnt out building, left abandoned and graffitied with arrows to help you try and navigate the awkward turns. I personally like this one a lot, especially by the standards of the N64. On DS, it was a little less impressive given the sheer volume of strong courses that game debuted, but I still enjoy it for what it has to offer though, and I'm probably the minority on that one. Let me know in the comment below. 
Thankfully, there is plenty more where that came from on the Game Boy Advance with Boo Lake and Broken Pier, two more classic spoopy maps. With more dastardly shortcuts to make and tight turns with those breakaway wall segments, I enjoy the originals but find the 3D improvements to be a much more faithful recreation of this classic theme, especially dipping underwater for an icy swim. It's morbid down here with the moonlight reflecting off the water's surface and only a shallow hint of warm light to reassure you. The originals are great, the remasters are much better. Man, I cannot get enough of this classic theme elevated to this level. We're definitely starting to see the bar getting raised now as we continue on to number 79, Peach Gardens. Coming back to normality a bit here, the bright and vibrant springtime course through the chain chomp infested hedge maze past flower beds and alongside the castle, much like Mario Circuit on the 3DS, this one is just a more appealing revision on the classic castle circuits that we're all too familiar with and the risk versus reward of runaway chomps holding onto items at crucial points in the race makes for a ton of different ways to tackle this level. Do you try to avoid the chomps or take them head on? Try for an item or just focus on gaining a boost on the wider sections of the track. Sure, it's nothing crazy, but it doesn't need to be. All it needs is maybe a fraction of extra challenge, and this would have placed higher up. The variation we get from taking the track in reverse and then flying up above the hedge maze gives the level a whole new perspective and one that shows just how fun an otherwise basic theme and level structure can be, as it lives on in the hearts of Mario Karters the world over. People all over the globe play these games on the daily, so from one part of the world to another, up next we've got Tokyo Blur, which also shines as a simple yet satisfying sprint through city streets, up onto expressways and across the bridge with that awesome view on the horizon. While not as cramped with iconic imagery when compared to other levels of this nature, Blur simply blurs the line of what makes a course good, and that it's not always about overcomplicated obstacles, crazy fantasy themes, or convoluted hazards. Instead, that a level should be made most fun by its gameplay, and provide just enough tools for players to achieve this without bombarding them with too much all at once. Which, in my opinion, is the conceptual foundation the series was built on and is executed well in this level thanks to some blasting turns and fast laps. And with that, we are officially at the halfway point of the video. Oh my goodness, man, let me tell you, this has already been so challenging just due to the sheer volume of quality content coming out of these games. It just never ends. and. Even already, we're seeing so many contenders get knocked out that could have very well have appeared within the top 50. But we're not quite there yet, so before we continue on, please remember to stand up and have a nice big stretch. Stretch your legs and get some fresh air, especially if you're watching this video within a single sitting, and refill your supplies as we continue on down the road to number 77. Alright, <laughs> maybe I'm a little biased putting this one in the top half of the rankings, but listen, genuinely, it's just nice to see Australia represented as more than just a desert like in most games. Sydney Sprint Circle's Circular Quay passing through the famous Opera House across the river to Luna Park, or park as it's known here. This is a simple street course once again, but includes plenty of cool jumps and turns, eventually snaking through Barangaroo Reserve. Yes, that is actually what it's called. The Harbour Bridge being the bigger set piece of course, and as far as tour regions go, even the music dials it up a little more with a very triumphant and boisterous tune. I could honestly listen to this all day. It's a solid little track with some excellent highlights, this one makes me really happy. Though there are maybe one or two dull moments transitioning between certain areas, otherwise this is still a bloody good effort and one which represents the Down Under very well. Flying across the Pacific for 14 hours will land you at Los Angeles Laps. 
I just want to start off this entry by saying that the concept of Mario Karters racing around a location that is almost just as famous for its appearance in the world of Grand Theft Auto games as it is for its actual real world location is just so, so wild to me. Finally, all of those batshit crazy mods have some canonical connection across both franchises. <laughs> anyway, the beachside area here steals the show, obviously, with the Santa Monica Pier, Venice Beach Skate Park, which I absolutely love as a big pro skater fan. The city streets are less appealing, in my opinion. Standard stuff, and still a lot of recognisable landmarks, also covering more ground for some longer, more varied laps. Thematically, though, this one is actually a little lacking compared to others. We can see Griffith Observatory up on the drab hillside, but where is the Hollywood sign? Is it a copyright thing? I mean, everyone else can do some sort of parody. Why not Mario Kart? And yeah, I don't know. While I do enjoy this level for what it is, I guess I'm just more surprised because I was expecting a race through, you know, sound stages and film backlots with little toads and goombas on different movie sets, but instead, I got the damn oil pumping fields. <laughs> what an odd decision. But look, regardless of that, this is still a very fun map. I just feel that some of the other city sprints honoured their inspiration a little better. Madrid Drive shows what I'm talking about. It stays a little more faithful to its locations, architecture and landmarks. There's plenty of winding streets and big turns. I love the open market square and the art gallery taking in all of the details. Not as much going on in this one, but that's fine as the layout is solid with some key moments. A big one of course being the football stadium. Man, I feel like that's half the reason Tour even exists to be honest, to cater to the easy sports demographics. Not much more to say on this one, it's just a very solid middle tier level. Next up is Wario Cup from the arcade games, featuring two courses, Diamond City and Snow Panic. Now this is neat, I love the design of this city first off, and the music is great too. Something kind of different that still fits really well. I'm starting to get some kind of cyberpunk, maybe even some Jet Set Radio vibes from this place. Race 2 sees the snowmaking machine blow up and create a giant avalanche that racers need to navigate, and then we get to do the entire thing again at night. And man, this is pretty. Layout-wise, like many of these levels, it's still quite basic, but there was definitely potential here for a remaster in my opinion, and the course layout would still offer a lot of chances for entertaining, combative gameplay, as well as skill-based racing as in your typical Mario Kart game. Man, I think I've mentioned it already, but it's a real shame that Nintendo has buried some of these hidden gems over time, and sure, while it is nice for each game to have its few exclusives to keep you coming back, I do feel that some of these have been greatly forgotten. As part of the original Mario Kart 8 DLC pack, this Nintendo legend finally made his debut to the franchise after many years of, quite frankly, being excluded. So what if the title is Mario Kart? Nintendo Kart would be bloody awesome, and this level is proof. While without the Legend of Zelda theming, this one may not have made it up so high, let's be realistic, there is no ignoring that this is yet another strong supporting level, which also just so happens to be a prime example of how to make a memorable crossover. The rupees replace coins, Link can ride on his horse instead of a cart, and if you're skilled enough, you can even collect the Master Sword on your way through the castle. It's simple, but I like it, and if the series was to branch out to include some Legend of Zelda influences more prominently in the future, I could only begin to imagine the epic race courses that would come of it. I mean, there is more than 30 years of history for that franchise as well, so make it happen, Nintendo. Super Zelda card. Let's do it. And speaking of decades past, let's go back those 30 years to the original game once again and take a look at Donut Plains. Fun fact, this theme has appeared across six total games, so we've got a lot of experience on these tracks. One and two are both really good despite their basic nature. The third one on the other hand, 
man, I hate it. I cannot do this level in the original game. Honestly, I rank out of the entire special cup on the first level. It's embarrassing. It's just some brutal turns, the water hazards. It's all a bit much at such blistering speeds. Thankfully, when it appeared again in Mario Kart 8, the water hazard wasn't as much of a problem, and now I can say that, yeah, I really enjoy these circuits. Simple, catchy tune as always, with years of history under its belt, just a hard course to argue with at this point in the list. Knocking out another arcade level now, and another Bowser stage. This time it's Bowser's Cup, featuring both the castle interior and the castle wall. This is honestly a really good duet of kart racing action. Despite its basic structure when compared to later Bowser-inspired maps, due to the handling limitations of these arcade games, the shorter levels feel like a natural evolution onto the classic 2D stages, which, to me, is really cool to see these concepts further realised once again. The aesthetic is there, executed perfectly, no complaints from me, and while the music is definitely not what you'd think of when you think of a Bowser level, god damn, this slaps hard. This is an absolute banger. I'm sure the remaster in DX is a lot more threatening in comparison, but I don't know, I, I prefer the original. What do you think? Anyway, if you can manage to get your drift on, then it's a blast winding around the creepy corridors, and visually, it's just breathtaking. If you happen across the arcades with a few mates, skip the baby shit and weed out the real men from the boys on this awesome track. Next up is Friendly Fella Jungle. Oh, <laughs> seriously, isn't he just the best thing ever? I would die for him and protect him at all costs. This Double Dash course has some really cute vibes. I love the art direction in this game and how it handles its foliage as just textures painted onto the map most of the time. It makes me think all the way back to Yoshi's Island at number 126. Even some modernization on the art direction like this could have gone a long way to improve that state. But anyway, Dino Dino has three core features. There's Dino, of course. He's stamping. Look at him go. Then we've got the split of bridges at the back of the level, giving you a few different options depending on your position in the race. And finally, inside of the giant cave with water bursts and that damn tricky shortcut across the chasm. I just cannot do this to save my life. Double Dash's physics simply don't gel with me, but in Mario Kart 7, the level made a triumphant return with glider physics, improving this a whole lot in my opinion. And getting up close and personal with the big boy leads into some rather fun and satisfying drifts towards the finish line. Excellent. Just excellent. And sticking with the familiar theme, for number 69 we have DK's Jungle Parkway, another classic N64 stage. I mean, who could forget that big river jump, winding jungle turns, and I always like the big cave at the end. You take that rickety rope bridge down and then do your best upwards turning drift to cut this corner as close as possible. Remember to stay in your lane though, or some asshole will start throwing these things at you. It's disappointing that you can phase through the boat on the river, but to make up for it, thankfully this boosted jump into a 90 degree turn, which may seem counterintuitive at first, actually invokes a lot of satisfaction once you learn the best methods for tackling this corner. Nothing beats landing directly into a drift and zooming away, leaving your opponents in the dust. Rocking on to Rock Rock Mountain, known in POW regions as Alpine Pass, which is less playful, this track is all set pieces despite its short length, opening up on this cliffside area with perilous drifts into the cave, a huge leap of faith into a long distance glide which is awesome, and then before you know it, you're speeding your way up that hill climb avoiding all of the boulders crashing down at you, and if you've built up enough speed, you can fly right over the starting line to complete a lap and ride that way of momentum to skip the entire first part of the map. 
It's really, really cool, and for a level called Rock Rock Mountain, it sure has a rocking tune to keep your adrenaline fired up. Next is Shroom Ridge from Mario Kart DS. More of a casual Sunday drive through the mountains this time, swerving through traffic at 100 miles per hour, dodging items and going off-road to skip ahead. Oh, well, seems there isn't actually a shortcut in the original. Whoops. Number 8 got us covered, though, with a nice cut over the grassy area and this gnarly chasm shortcut, which more often than not lands you in hot water. Damn. You know, when this track first appeared in the booster pack, many fans were disappointed with its basic graphics. I mean, you look at the retro courses in the base game, the graphical enhancements are off the chart. Obviously, this is a symptom of being ported over from Tua, which genuinely isn't up to par graphics-wise, but honestly, I actually prefer the flat, colourful look. It calls back to the classic days of the franchise, whereas this hyper-realistic shit we see gives Mario running in Unreal Engine vibes, and it's not great. That's just my two cents on that little discussion point, though. Um, I'm curious what you guys think. If you prefer the, the, the crisp HD stylized stuff from 8, or the more blocky, cartoony, kid-friendly stuff from Tour. Let me know. Despite whatever your feelings may be on Tour as a game overall, there is no way that we can't still be appreciative for what it brought to the table, as Bangkok Rush is a track that I didn't realise I was longing for until it was announced. I mean, first off, there are so many incredible landmarks and monuments from the temples, the rivers, and of course the famous railway market. You know, that one that you see all over social media? What a perfect spot for a kart racer to speed through. But it's also not too often I can just indulge in the architecture of a level, especially one appearing in an otherwise fantasy, cartoonish world like the Mario games. But all of these incredible structures offer so much to look at. It's a track for skilled drivers too, with lots of drifting turns, but still offers plenty of fun moments for casual players, such as bouncing on the market covers or exploring up on the elevated train tracks. This is a very solid tour level, and if you enjoy that, then we've got plenty more coming up. Vancouver Velocity might appear a little more generic due to the boring street sections, but the treetop boardwalk through the snow-covered mountaintops is very pretty, especially at night. We've got more big glides here to breeze through, parks, and of course, an ice hockey stadium. I wouldn't have expected anything else. It's got a nice tune as well. While I do really enjoy playing this one, both in 8 and in Tour when I've had the chance, it does somewhat lack the special theming. I mean, as an outsider, beyond a few key objects on the map, this could almost be anywhere for me, so if I have any criticism for this one, it's that it needed just a little bit more identity. In my opinion, anyway. And if you want an example of what I mean, then check out New York Minute. Honestly, I'm shocked that we got an official New York level in Mario Kart before a new Donk City inspired course, but I guess, what's the difference? While the various laps may not stand out as much spanning Central Park and urban streets, it's the visuals and set design which sell this as New York City. I mean, it's so glamorous. Times Square is lit up, and you've got the red carpets, and some of the most exciting spots to take advantage of for rapid and chaotic racing. In fact, while it is short, maybe to a point of flaw, I just can't get enough of playing this one. I can race it session after session and squeeze some of the most thrilling moments out of its selection of landmarks and road hazards. An excellent map, but still not the best or even the most gorgeous to witness. Without question, Singapore Speedway is the most instantly recognisable tour level thanks to the sheer volume of prominent features. We've got more of those stunning neon lights at night time, all of the colourful gardens and archways, wicked winding streets. Am I missing anything else? Uh, oh, of course. The Marina Bay Sands Hotel. I mean, come on. It makes for the perfect track design, flying up to the infinity pool for a vantage point above the entire map skyline, and then drifting all the way back down is simply breathtaking. I could almost close my eyes and feel like I'm actually there. It's just an incredible location that has been perfectly adapted to Mario Kart better than many others that we've seen already. 
and just the way it makes use of the space by having each new lap integrated into a different part of that central landmark really helps it to stand out big time for me as purely unforgettable and overflowing with gameplay potential. On to something a little different now, Wario's Shipyard, or Galleon if you prefer, is a really solid mix of castle and submersible racing action with some decent splits in the path and a slight yet satisfying shortcut. I love the big shipwreck crashed into the rocks that makes for the perfect big drift around before diving back under and while otherwise it may not be anything all that special, I don't know, this is just one of those tracks that's executed well with a catchy tune, but what really gives it some unique qualities is the larger emphasis on the underwater driving, which is not something that you see too often. Another surprisingly decent course is Piranha Plant Cove, which is also primarily underwater focused, which at first glance I thought might greatly hinder this level, but the dynamic flow between the submersible physics and the big jumps across rocky coastlines and temple ruins makes for an incredible combo. It can at times feel a little gloomy down here, but again, that sets it apart from other daytime beach courses. The chirpy theme song picks up the slack on those party mode vibes, however, and with so many fun caves and submerged springs to catch a boost off of, if you're seeing this one for the first time and haven't tried it out, I highly recommend it now that it's been added in the final wave of Mario Kart 8's booster packs, because it didn't take long for this one to cement itself as a hidden gem within the franchise upon my first time playing. And speaking of Mario Kart 8, now I'd like to discuss a trilogy of levels that all feel like a set to me, keeping on with this somewhat familiar theme. They all go quite nicely together, deliver as strong medium difficulty courses, and never disappoint when they appear. The first of these is Shy Guy Falls. My memories racing this one are endless. I just can't get enough of the cliff formations and drifts, but then much like Rock Rock Mountain, we've got a big vertical climb up a waterfall this time, dropping boost pads, only to then hairpin into a massive flight back down to the cliffs below. Oh, I just love this. It makes perfect use of the anti-gravity without feeling overly gimmicked, and still offers some heated competition despite its simple nature for a moment filled with awe and excitement. Man, you just love to see it. And coming up right after that is Dolphin Shoals, which also relies heavily on large water sections. There's big jumps, big open caves with boosters, and a big fella that you can ride along. Hell yeah! Seriously, this section is one of my favourites in the entire franchise, and then when you resurface onto the gnarly rocks above a swirling whirlpool, that damn saxophone kicks the tropical tunes into overdrive with a heart jolter of excitement as you make those final crucial moves towards first place. It's damn excellent! It's not as drawn out or dramatic as perhaps some others, but this is still an absolute ripper and delivers everything that the water park back at 133 should have showcased for this game. But the show stealer of this little trilogy, in my opinion, has got to be Thwomp Ruins, as for an opening cup course, there is a lot going on here. I mean, the first thing that gets you is the music once again. I love this song. Inside the temples, you've got the option of staying flat on the floor or opting for a wall ride leading out into this lake area infested with Thwompy Boys. Split paths, speed boosts, more wall rides, and you've got to be quick to make your mind up on which route to take because it can get pretty unwieldy here very quickly. But I think it's the simplicity of this ending area that does it for me. It's nothing crazy, it's just more ruined roadways, including a simple yet tricky cut before a final glide to victory. When I think of Mario Kart 8, these three always come to mind first for me, and I hope they do for you as well. I mean, with all that's been added to this game over the past decade, I'm still always stoked to race these levels thanks to their familiar, almost nostalgic atmosphere that truly encapsulates those feelings of staying up with friends jamming out some Mario Kart. Oh, okay, now this is a level that's been made just for me, and if you've been around this channel long enough, then you know that I love little guys running around on countertops and all of that awesome Toy Story-esque shit. 
squeaky clean sprint means bath time for the carting crew because all of those bomb ashes and banana skins make a big mess. Diving into the tub and down the drain, it's kind of icky how gross it is down here and some poor fool lost their wedding ring. What an idiot. Back out onto the floor combating fans and soap suds sliding you all over the bathroom tiles, you've got a few options to make it back up. Launching up over the toilet, and thank god because if the bathtub pipes look like this then I'd hate to see the toilet pipes. We can go through the towel rack with a soft turn, boost up to the finish line, or if you're feeling extra frisky, you can even go a level further up onto high up shelves above the sink area for some extra items and speed boosts. All the way up here at the top of the map, you can really take in the finer details, such as the NES Mario inspired tiles on the walls and countless other little details. Of all the new courses we've seen added into this game, Squeaky Clean certainly doesn't disappoint by delivering a highly themed, highly memorable track for number 57. And that's right, we're quickly closing in on the top 50 now. My word, we are on record pace, so let's keep the momentum going, shall we, with perhaps a shock late entry into the rankings. I mean, it was certainly a shock to see Rosalina's Ice World announced for the final booster pack, but hey, this is a really fun snow course. That opening downward spiral is nerve-wracking excitement. You've got fractured ice shelves to ride or dive underneath, and the decision between playing it safe or risking it for gold on that outer pathway through the slippery caves all adds up to deliver a really strong map for a theme often the laughing stock of the entire franchise. In fact, I can only think of maybe two or three snow-themed courses that can top this one, and that's saying something because this is a solid map, and its inclusion in 8 cements this. I know it's probably not the course that everyone was expecting or even wanting to see, but it's good, man, and it's nice to see a character who is from one of the most influential mainline Mario titles get represented well in the kart racing spin-off. I find it to be a little tougher to make that jump onto the floating layer of ice in this version, but it's still doable and adds in that extra roll of the dice for each lap. Time for another crossover now, it's Animal Crossing time. Okay, let's quickly address the elephant in the room. This is a very basic level. Not that there is anything wrong with that per se, but it's hardly a technical masterpiece. What it is the master of though is character. Across all four seasons, starting off with the warm summer days down by the beach, by autumn the leaves begin to turn this track into a glowing festival of fun before winter finally kicks in, coating the land with glossy, sparkling snow. The gorgeous lights bringing some festive colour into the night sky before spring comes along and the track once again blossoms back to life. There is no other course that does this. Animal Crossing is treated with the utmost respect here, and it's lovely to see. And I'm not even a biased Nintendo fanboy saying that. I've never even played an Animal Crossing game in my life, but I just love this track so much. It's a truly unique course the year round with endless replay value. It's stunning. Nothing could possibly ruin your day enjoying this one. Going back to the jungle with some more water courses that I mentioned a moment ago, Mario Kart 8's original DLC back on the Wii U over-delivered once again with Wild Woods, bringing us a vine surfing adventure through the trees, down slippery water slides and through treetop towns which is definitely giving off some Donkey Kong vibes if you ask me. It's perfect and similar to, you know, racing around on a bathroom floor, riding up through the treetops like an insect creates such a compelling environment for that fast-paced action that we crave, and its relationship with the visuals and music hit perfectly to create what almost feels like a familiar Disney romp. And due to its natural turns and winding roads, you have to take every opening you can get to gain an advantage because there won't be many offered across three laps. So it's all down to your skill as a driver, especially on that cut directly before the finish line. And uh... <laughs> You'd think with all of the Mario Kart that I've played by now that I'd actually be able to make this jump. <laughs> yeah, that's embarrassing. Gotta really dig deep and find your inner Tarzan to become a legend on this track. An undeniable legend of the franchise in its own right. Oh, now we're up to Cheeseland on the Game Boy Advance. 
Man, this is a really challenging level, but damn is it fun when... Oh, for God's sakes. Hang on. Let, let's try that again. For the 2D style gameplay, this one is very difficult the first time you play, with a lot of continuous drift turn combos, but man, once you nail it, this one is so much fun. Revived in Mario Kart 8, we've got some additional shortcuts and a more vertical take on the terrain, which is nice to see, though, I don't know, something about the original just speaks to me a lot more. It's wacky, you're not prepared for it, and as far as the course design for Super Circuit, this is one of the best. In fact, out of all the Super Circuit levels we've been ranking, Cheese Land came in at number 4 overall, just barely missing out on a podium position, which is an incredible showing for an early portable level. And to think that there are still GBA locations left to come? Incredible really just showing us what the Game Boy Advance was made of, outshining plenty of newer, more modern games in this ranking. Sticking with the classics, Bowser returns once again to deliver us to hell with this brutal castle course from Mario Kart 64. Laden with square corners, infested with bloodthirsty thwomps, including ones that directly target you, yeah, thanks you prick, there isn't much room to move until you break out onto the large stairwell and courtyards, but you've got to watch out for that tiny little rope bridge over an ocean of lava. That one's a killer. This is a basic level, I find it much better on the Wii game with the improved handling, although I am using a Wiimote and steering wheel to play this, so when I say that it's challenging, I'm talking next level challenge. This might not be the most advanced level, but I find this old school classic still has a lot to offer, and of course still a level that I'm sure resides in the hearts and tormented minds of many who will never forget the torture they endured here over the years thanks to Bowser's never ending quest to take over the Mushroom Kingdom. But from one beloved N64 level to another, it's time to eliminate the big one. Rainbow Road 64. Yes, just missing out on a top 50 position. Honestly, I'm surprised it even made it this far to be completely real with you, as I am not a fan of this level. <gasps> yeah, I said it. While it's a very triumphant ending to the Special Cup and an endurance against friends, it is too damn long. Three laps of this with next to no obstacles on the course, I'm getting Wario Stadium vibes, but at least this is pretty to look at. Even still though, I would have placed this one much lower down if it wasn't for its return in Mario Kart 8, dialing the visuals up several notches to deliver possibly the greatest retro tribute of any in the franchise. Look, excuse my language, I've been trying to behave myself for this video given that Mario is a much more family friendly mascot, but I'm sorry, I've just gotta say it. This level is fucking gorgeous. Mouthwatering even. The city down below, all of the lights, the fireworks, the road is no longer a blistering hard to look at rainbow, now a regal dance floor of delight which thankfully has a lot more going on now. From wavy roads, edges without barriers, bouncing chomps to avoid, but they had to go and miss the mark by a fraction. Now with only a single lap to play, it doesn't feel as special. It's over before you even know it, and had we gotten just two laps of this joyous joyride through the stars, then maybe, just maybe, Rainbow Road 64 could have made it to the top 50, but for as grandiose as it is, this just can't compete with the blistering standards of the franchise that it set the standard for all those years ago. Still, despite all of that, I can't take away what this level has accomplished in offering players with those epic lifelong memories and countless multiplayer moments. You know, versing a mate who thinks they're untouchable only to breeze on by at the last moment with a carefully timed item is as timeless as this level is. Man, <laughs> I am just in shock. 
I'm in utter and complete shock because I just don't know how there are still so many tremendous levels left to come in this video. But here we are, the top 50. And to think, we still haven't even eliminated a single game from the race. Man, what a true testament to the bankable quality of this franchise, man. Holy shit. Now, if you're still watching the video, then please consider subscribing and remember to hit that bell so that you get notified of all of my future uploads because, goddamn, man, we're going to kick things into overdrive and speed down the road like a Formula One because it's time for number 50, Ice Ice Outpost. This glacial gauntlet of split pathways on the surface isn't very intimidating until you start to unthaw some of the tougher turns and even tougher alternate routes. That's the appeal of Outpost for me, is that it's got a lot to offer for both young novice players and veterans alike. Hell, I've been playing these games on and off my entire life, and I still struggle to get a grasp on some of these little cuts, but sometimes they're a necessity. It's challenging to learn, but not a level of frustration, instead making you want to try again and again until you can make it. And for an ice level, it's one of the better ones. Ironically, it features no slippery ice, no snowmen or igloos or anything blocking the path. This is just a pure race with plenty of chilling moments. For number 49, we've got the funky Electrodome, another good contender for should have been this game's Rainbow Road in my opinion, but nonetheless, I always enjoy this course. It's magical with wall rides, good vibes, split paths, and the whole thing has a really good bop to it. The digitized course lights up and the inverted split is really neat as well and not nearly as sickening as you might think. In fact, this is another masterclass in the anti-gravity level design in 8 as this track is pure turns and long straightaways that all flow seamlessly to create a super memorable track. I absolutely cannot get enough of this one. So let's keep that techno music blaring, fun boys, as we head over to Germany for Berlin Byways. Through the glorious Brandenburg Gate and down... You know what, I'm not even going to attempt that. <laughs> this is actually a really strong map with plenty of turns, hidden little areas to discover, and the variety of monuments blend together seamlessly for a nice tour through the city. But, oh my god. The Berlin Wall literally falling before my very eyes? That is just astonishing. <laughs> I don't know about you, but something about this is just uncomfortably funny to me. Like the existence of communism within the Mario universe, or perhaps even for the fact that this isn't even the Berlin Wall's first appearance in the franchise. Yeah, quick history lesson. Mario's Time Machine was a poor attempt at a history lesson as it was, plagued with awful tedious gameplay and a joke for even existing in the first place. The real joke is that, yep, there it is, the Berlin Wall in all of its 8-bit glory, in a Mario game. And would you look at that? Guess who stopped communism, ladies and gentlemen? He really is a hero for the ages. <laughs> anyway, I really didn't want to go on a tangent about the wall, but it just stands out so much. And then I learned about the Time Machine game, so I'm sorry. That was just a lot that I needed to take in and unpack. At the end of the day, Berlin Byways remains one of the more impressive tour levels thanks to the fun street sections, rad drifting turns, and of course, its famous iconography. But the classical instruments blend well with the electro-techno backing track for an absolute winner of a level theme that is good enough to stand on its own. Roma Vanti is definitely another one which stands out due to just how good it is at implementing its checklist of landmarks into the course design. Drifting upwards through the Colosseum on your first turn into a huge glide, all the little plazas, market squares and fountains to swerve on by, and another beautiful song. This level is pure class by focusing on the core of Mario Kart gameplay without oversaturating any of the gimmicks while still providing a competitive course that's great to play. This one works because it's fundamentally sound. Sure, it's a tour location, but whack this same map layout onto any theme from the franchise and it will be just as iconic in my opinion. 
Wario Coliseum from Double Dash is an extraordinary spectacle with its winding spaghetti layout centered around a huge dome of death. Launch up into this giant structure for prolonged power sliding opportunities and some cramped racing action. For a special cup opener, it steals the show honestly, and having not grown up with this game, I never knew it existed until now. Seriously, this is a Double Dash exclusive to this day, which gives this game something special to keep coming back for. But with the, with the chaotic nature of this one, I can only begin to imagine how it would have played with 8's anti-gravity. I mean, the dome alone could make for a wild battle arena, and that massive jump at the bottom is intimidating as hell, but I'd expect nothing else from such a despicable prick as Wario. My only gripe for this one is the level song doesn't really fit, but otherwise, it's nice to still be seeing some hidden gems shine so brightly. But moving on from the hidden gems now to the iconic levels burned into our retinas, the original Mario Circuit is definitely one of those. Now you're probably shocked that such simple courses are up so high, but surely I've made my point by now that foundationally a good kart racing level needs to be fun, technical and memorable. The trifecta achieved by every single iteration of these four courses, and it's for that reason why this overall theme has appeared the most out of any other throughout the franchise. That's right, we've got the SNES Original and the Game Boy Advance ports, the very first Retro Cups which appeared in the DS and Wii games, 3DS, Tour, and now Mario Kart 8 Deluxe. That is seven overall appearances, which means that's every release since November of 2005. And it remains just as jovial as ever thanks to the bouncy music, cute and simplistic visuals, and for just being a pure kart racing stage. No matter the game, no matter the era of the series, you will never be let down by these ones, and looking all the way back to the original Man, Circuits 3 and 4 offered up some real challenge, let me tell you. Nothing was more satisfying than finally making it through that last lap to unlock the special cup for the very first time. Pure, uncontended, great memories for generations of gamers. But, sadly, this is where Super Mario Kart's journey comes to an end. Number 44 and the final Super Nintendo level is, of course, the original Rainbow Road. Tough as nails, but man, soaring through space on this galactic gallivant is always a nerve-wracking yet joyful time. The visuals and that song which creates an aura of excited fear is just unmatched and it would only get better and better throughout the years. In fact, for as basic as this concept may be, not only did it inspire countless more of its kind, but it even trumped some of them. I mean, hell, with the disappointing Rainbow Road in 8, and even the N64 course not fully delivering, this was the best Rainbow Road in Mario Kart 8 for such a long, long time key word being was. And no matter where it decided to show up, it was always a blast, and so much so that it has had the most overall appearances out of any track within the franchise. Seriously. Mario Circuit's general theme appeared in seven games overall, but this one single, very unique course has appeared six times overall. On the Super Nintendo, Super Circuit, 7 on 3DS, as DLC in Mario Kart 8 on the Wii U, and then in the base version of Deluxe on the Switch, and finally Tour, which, with all of its silly little additions and revisions and mini-games, this might be one of the best places to experience the level. It's so much fun and just goes to show the potential at your fingertips when presented with greatness. Flawlessly executed the first time around, but now this will be the last time we'll hear from the original Mario Kart in this ranking. I'm sure that I've surprised a lot of people with how well this game performed, but I think that's on you because this was an instant classic that still holds up after 30 years. And still, this is only the first game to be eliminated! Oh boy! Just barely inching out Rainbow Road is Rainbow Road from Super Circuit. 
Yeah, two in a row. Now let me tell you, it's a tragedy that the only way to experience this level is by playing the GBA game, because in my opinion, it actually does several things better than the more well-known Super Nintendo level. I mean, for one, it's a lot easier on the eyes with a prettier palette. While some edges still result in sheer drops to your death, others are lined with jumps that can hinder weaker races, while giving the more inventive ones a big advantage to cut corners. But finally, this track has one of the best shortcuts in the franchise, with its giant launch pad. I mean, look at this thing! How freaking wild is that? Man, you can try and try and try and still not be able to master this damn thing. It's more reliable to stick to the main pathway, but what a tease! Because for those who can manage to pull it off successfully, a sense soaring through the air to land at the front of the race. Holy shit! I did it! I did it! Ah, oh, well, damn. <laughs> that was short-lived. I mean, if you can execute this consistently, then you deserve a medal. I would have loved to have seen this playable in 3D with modern Mario Kart physics, but I guess this one will remain a special reason to return to this classic from time to time, because, man, I want to practice this until I can get it perfectly. I must point out, though, catching a falling star hurts you? That doesn't make any sense. The last lap should have allowed every player to catch a star and gain that invincible boost to the finish line, so should we see this one appear in the future? That's on my wish list for sure. One track that has really jumped up a few spots thanks to its later revisions has got to be Cooper Trooper Beach. Now, I've always loved this one since the original N64 title. It's wide open, but it's got some cunning shortcuts, excellent rock formations, and with the tide slowly creeping in on a few of the bends, bottlenecks races to create some rather memorable moments. But otherwise, this is still a product of its time until Mario Kart 7 on the 3DS breathed new life into this classic in a major way. I mean, it's much prettier, the stronger graphical fidelity helps out a lot, but from a design perspective, this game's introduction of underwater driving has transformed this beachfront area into a more modern level. The big cove that you normally have to drift around can now serve as a direct route through the beach area, and the shortcut through the cliffside, which was rather perilous and awkward before, now flows much better for a more fluent and enjoyable racing experience. Man, when I first got up to this one, I just found myself replaying it again and again, which has got to stand for something. Oh wow, another one already? Damn, okay. This time we've got Double Dash's Rainbow Road, another hidden gem that, as a Nintendo outsider, I've never experienced before. Seeing the jump in quality from the N64 to this course is stunning, as it outshines in every way possible. The pastel rainbow colours, nighttime cityscape down below, and some tricky turns mixed in with big downhill vibes and a large, iconic, interactive element. Huge boost pads and upward spirals, I particularly enjoy the big pipe launch back up to the top of this wonderful track. I think it's this particular era of Mario Kart which defined the specialness of Rainbow Road and cemented it as that iconic imagery for the franchise, perhaps even for the wider Mario series in general. I mean, it made it into the movie, and rightfully so, as this course and all of its contemporaries all landed during Nintendo's second big boom. So, from one Rainbow Road to the next? Holy shit, we're knocking these out in rapid succession, huh? But if that represents anything, it's a consistent standard of quality. This time it's the DS's turn, delivering yet another whimsical race through the stars. Both of these sit in my mind as very similar. I mean, if you look at the start of this, I can already see a segment directly ripped from the previous level, but the DS does offer a few new features. It's got a giant loop leading us into rings that chime as you pass through, before another big corkscrew through the centre of the loop. Damn, this is like a roller coaster, and once again, the only way to experience this track is by dusting off your DS and loading up that old save file. But I'd highly recommend doing so, as the DS entry of the franchise has been the long-running survivor of these rankings, and with plenty of juice still left in the tank. I mean, the only thing holding this one back is some of the automation in the level, which I'm just not a fan of, but hey, I just can't deny the incredible moments made on this track.
Time for another Wario level. This time it's Mount Wario from number 8, starting high up above the mountains as you ski and sledge your way down the slippery slopes, skidding around corners and through the treacherous cave systems. This is such a highlight for me, gliding through, and then we're out onto possibly the biggest set piece being the dam. This anti-gravity segment borrows some ideas from other fan favourites, but makes it feel more special, as this is a downhill sprint, so you've only got your one shot to take advantage. And then come the trees. Oh my god, this is terrifying. But the reward of a clean jump into the final slalom with the finish line in sight is such a satisfying one that so few downhill maps have managed to execute so effectively. And every single time, I just can't wait to do it all over again, discover new routes and learn the most optimal path to the bottom of this slope in record time. Superb stuff, and this is also a real win for the various snow scenes within the series. Another Wario map? Damn, this video has gone from who's Wario to hot damn Wario kicks ass in the span of about 10 places. Wario's gold mine is one of the instantly recognisable Wii levels thanks to its free falling dips, wide bends and all of the damn hazards getting in your way. Now I'll be honest, I suck at this one, but I still can't get enough of it. But I think it shines best in number 8 thanks to a few key fixes. This section, which I find to be a little confronting, has now been adjusted to suit the anti-gravity and seems to flow much better into the next part of the map which improves how the player can maintain speed and even gain a little more. By sneaking past those minecarts offers a risky yet perfect chance to gain that extra boost needed. This is why you bring retro classics back, to enhance them and improve on the groundwork laid which, at this point in the video, the groundwork is already so damn strong that few others could really benefit benefit from any changes. Bowser's Castle on the DS remains exclusive to this release, which is again just another reason to dust the old thing off. A more simplified structure than some other castles still manages to deliver with cool and inventive track pieces including the turntable floors and this weird pipe thing which takes a little bit of getting used to. But thankfully, failure here doesn't lead to instant death, giving the driver a second chance before the final stretch of the race, boosting across those platforms towards the finish line. The only shortcut that I can think of is this one on the turntable, which I swear doesn't even feel worth it half of the time, but the music and visuals also give this course life like only the more retro stylized, charming Nintendo systems are capable of. Big Super Nintendo aesthetic off of this one, which as a childhood fan, definitely earns it some points. The big guy would strike again on the 3DS with yet another heavy metal melee through underwater level geysers, collapsing rocky roadways, and that big jump into a glide through searing waterfalls of fire as you're forced back inside the madness. I really enjoy this one, however it is also just a little bit short, hence why it's getting knocked out ahead of some other strong Bowser Castle maps. But the song sells this track so well thanks to the heavier instruments and an overall more threatening aura about it in comparison. The advancements from the DS game are strong while still paying homage to its older brother. As you can see, the turning pipe is back with both an interior and exterior path. This thing is really funky man, I, I can't say that I've ever seen this sort of obstacle done anywhere else in the franchise. But by this point in the ranking, we're in the cream of the crop and for all of the creepy castles and spooky speedways that we've witnessed, I feel like Twisted Mansion from Mario Kart 8 deserves its props for combining all of these concepts into a single map. The grandeur of this ghoulish race opened perfectly with a symphony of booze contorting the dining room ahead of the opening stretch before leading the player through a flooded basement. The way this course moves makes the entire thing feel alive, giving it a really creepy feeling, and the animated statues slamming down in the courtyards make this otherwise solid filler map a much more memorable spectacle than most other grand spectacles of the franchise. I mean, it's beaten out the vast majority of memorable, yet often overhyped Rainbow Roads, and it's even beaten some Bowser Castle maps, with only three of those left that we're yet to see. 
The only thing this map is missing that I can possibly think of is a small tribute to the boardwalks and broken piers of old. But regardless, still a stellar level and a joy to return to after almost 10 odd years of racing. So from one iconic course to another, it's time to break out those jungle drums for another Donkey Konga through the bright and colourful DK Mountain. Blasting out from a barrel with the sight of that grumpy volcano off in the distance, you quickly begin the winding descent back down, sliding around corners, avoiding falling boulders, and this corner here, man, I swear, as if the giant crevice wasn't enough of a hazard combined with the game's springy physics, the other racers love to litter this area with bananas and other items just to make that last little bit of track before the finish line that much tougher. But it's still a fun track, man. The refinements in the Wii game and now Mario Kart 8 help it to stand tall amongst what is quickly becoming an overwhelming abundance of strong downhill maps. And Donkey Kong's got another one up his sleeve. DK's snowboard cross country is like if DK Mountain and Mount Wario had a baby. Barrel launch to the top of the slopes, more of those excellent hairpins and snow ramps to boost off of, leading to the big half pipes to show off your trick skills. It's by far one of the shorter downhill slalom style maps, but that keeps the pace fast, the race intense, and forces the player to perfect their skills if they want to ride away with the win. Another classic later added to 8 via tour, I'm just so happy to see this one back as it's perfect for competitive play while still serving as a great mid-level standard on the difficulty spectrum. Now, thanks to its revival, an entirely new generation get to grow up shredding these famous peaks and forming lifelong gaming memories. Alright guys, I'm sorry to say, but it's the end of the road for Donkey Kong's contributions to this list, and up real soon, we're gonna see another game be eliminated entirely. But first, we've got DK Jungle from 7, and later Mario Kart 8. Taking a bit of DKC Returns inspo for this one, which is nice to see, and it's also the only DK course to feature the incredibly catchy and memorable jungle hijinks tune that defines the character's personality. Carving through the jungle and out to this stunning golden banana temple never ceases to take your breath away, and the same can be said for the giant totems blowing hot air around trying to throw you off course. One of my favourite things about this level is how it ends, with the option of a quicker cut over a log directly towards the finish, or the safer but ever so slightly longer drift around the outside. It's always a tempting decision, but one that can sadly end in tragedy right before the end of a race, but if you nail this just right, then hot damn, this is a level that you won't soon forget. However, it may not be the greatest Donkey Kong map of the Mario Kart franchise. No, in fact, there is one DK level left that many may not have even heard of or even had the opportunity to play. And that would be the Donkey Kong Cup from Arcade Grand Prix Deluxe, featuring a combo of the DK Jungle and the Bananan Labyrinth. Oh yeah, I bet you forgot that these arcade games were even still eligible in the rankings, but don't be so shocked, as this entrant is what I'd have to consider the greatest tribute to this beloved franchise to ever be raced on. Starring that same golden banana temple, we also get to explore vine-laden treetops, fast and furious minecart tracks through the mountains, and some absolutely stunning temple ruins, which can barely maintain their structural integrity because these drivers are so damn crazy. Honestly, this feels like a Donkey Kong level like no other, and aside from it missing the appropriate music, would have been the perfect candidate for a revival on the Switch. But sadly, not only is this level cursed to exist exclusively in the arcades, but some machines may not even include this course to play, as it was released post-launch as a DLC cup. Yeah, 
So arcades would have needed to download the update for their machine, and it's because of this that many people may sadly never get to try this one out for themselves. It's a real devastating loss for the Mario Kart community. There is an alternative method of play, but unfortunately, it's locked behind a paywall, which if you are interested, then you'll have to find that one by yourself. But the crazy thing about this is that this isn't even the only arcade cup hidden away in obscurity like this. The final level from the arcade games to appear in the rankings at the high spot of number 30 is the Namco Cup. A significantly improved Pac-Man inspired stadium circuit complete with vaporwave retro futuristic visuals and a second course including the Namco Museum, highlighting a historical lineup of characters and franchise from back in the arcade days. Now just look at this in comparison. What an absolutely game changing glow up. Dig Dug gets an entire area, but keen-eyed players will also spot references to Galaga, Mappy Mouse, and Tower of Draga. An absolute treat to behold, and look, you might be bothered that I place this one so high up, and perhaps I'm being a little bit biased, but in my opinion, if you're going to do a crossover, then this is how you do it. You pay tribute and respect while integrating it seamlessly to feel like it always belonged in the mix. I would have absolutely loved to have seen Pac-Man and this Grand Prix make it into 8 Deluxe, but once again, only in the arcades, only via a DLC update, and despite its incredibly fun and fast-paced design, only played by a small fraction of the Mario Kart fanbase. That crime sadly ends a very strong run from arguably one of the weaker entries in the series, but in my opinion anyway, this is simply a no contest for one of the most addicting Mario titles out there. Man, I'm on the edge of my seat with this one. I mean, this has got to be one of the most jam-packed, highly anticipated, every level ranked videos that I've ever attempted. And with so many strong contenders suddenly getting knocked out all around us, well, it must be noted that several games left are only hanging on by a mere thread. Which means that we have to ask ourselves, which one is strong enough to go the distance and win that golden trophy? Drop the pedal and start burning rubber because Bowser Castle 8 is gonna kick your ass! The giant fiery king of the Coopers is here to ruin your day by disturbing the track and block the path as a huge intimidating foe. Various anti-gravity segments and splits in the path stand in your way and as usual, those damn right angle corners are ever present to make your race ten times harder. It's this twisted and confusing architecture which gives it that all-encompassing feeling of terror and yet all makes for a great time learning how to perfectly manoeuvre each new turn. But I don't think anything hits quite as hard as that tune. Man, that's dope. Gives Jack Black and Tenacious D a run for their money, let me tell you. My only critique of this one is being a little shorter than I maybe would have liked. You know, like Rainbow Road, these courses should define that epic feeling and challenge associated with the mastery of these games. A detail which I feel that Double Dash executed that itty bitty little fraction better. You're barely through the front door of the castle before thwomps start raining down upon you as you try to sneak through the skinny hallways and bottlenecks of the course. It's very easy to see where a lot of inspiration for the previous level comes from, and while maybe not as overcompensating as some others, the contemporary castle is a lot more traditional in a sense due to its less complex obstacles. Then it's back outside the castle walls to climb up and up to meet Bowser face to face. This is the earliest example that we have of some kind of Bowser hazard on the course itself attacking drivers, which is really cool to see and which would become a feature of later iterations as we've seen already. 
There are some brutal turns in this one, and it's long too, making it an endurance of your karting abilities. So many long straightaways to contend with, and little to no opportunities to get a boost. This is truly end of game challenge, now that we're in the final stages of this video. for Ninja Hideaway, an absolute blast from Booster Pack 1. Defined by its dojo of high up framework routes and falling spikes of doom in your path, you get launched up to a higher structure on top of the gorgeous landscape lined with bamboo and blossoming trees, which then leads onto a rooftop rush hour. It's short, snappy, and damn it kicks hard with that awesome fusion rock song. Every time I play this track, it feels like a fresh new experience thanks to the variety of different lines you can take through the different hallways and levels of the buildings. And I really enjoy this rather subtle shortcut here. There is just so much goodness hidden away on Ninja Hideaway, an absolutely incredible addition to the upper echelon of Mario Kart stardom, as this rather brief loop is constantly bustling with intense action. And staying on theme, Dragon Driftway snakes along the back and through the inside of this huge dragon structure. It's another temple it seems, but going from such hard 90 degree turns into such a winding, flowing track that feels like it's made of 90% drifting, this one requires a bit more learning to get good at to be able to take advantage of those very limited cuts, which is often essential to get a win on this one. I love this track, have loved it since the day I first laid eyes on number 8, and I hope that you all agree with me that this one offers up some intense yet satisfying moments. And there are plenty of smaller details too. You can see Laika 2 doing their best kung fu pandering on the walls, and the beams across the ceiling appear to feature a throwback to classic Mario overworld designs. Man, you'd never be able to even notice that blasting through this tube at 200cc, but man, it just goes to show the level of detail and respect given to extend this course into the higher ranks. Number 25 is Royal Raceway, which is also the last entry for the classic N64 title. With its royally steep cliff sides, incredibly well done circuit sections, and featuring one of the most epic jumps of the entire series launching over the lake with that castle off in the background, I guess this would still be considered your generic Mushroom Kingdom circuit level as we've seen so many times before now, but this one is just designed so perfectly. Precise and fun corners, it's got the big highlight moment that everyone remembers, and you can even venture off the beaten track to explore around the outer grounds of the castle, which for the time was just such a rad little easter egg, and one that sadly didn't make it into later revisions. Not to be seen again until Mario Kart 8 almost 20 years later, and this one is a visual masterpiece. I love seeing more of those blossoms falling from the trees, the regal eccentricities, and with the franchise's control scheme dialed in by this point, makes this circuit a hyper-competitive track online a much beloved tribute to the final level from a much beloved game. Though it may have started this list off in poor form, Mario Kart 64 truly was the launching pad for the 3D kart racing genre back in the day, and its legacy still stands tall after all of these years thanks to strong, nostalgic locations such as this one. Super Circuit is still hanging in there too, with some more standout additions to the franchise such as Ribbon Road. Before we wrap this game up in a nice little bow, this tough course presents us with one of the trickiest opening turns of the franchise, directly spiralling into a boosted jump, soon followed by another which can be really annoying at times. So you've just got to keep practicing and practicing, and once you nail it, man, this track is wild. A real technical driver's playground despite its childish themes. Seeing this fully realised in MK8 was just a mind-blowing experience, again adopting the tiny little fellas within a huge realistic interior aesthetic. This time it's a child's bedroom, 
big Toy Story vibes from this one. But thanks to the advancements in 3D technology, it gives this map so much more life. Now we're skidding through castle playsets, winding by the wind-up Cooper Troopers, and there are some rather sneaky and very challenging shortcuts to take advantage of now. All of those additions really elevated this one into the higher rankings, as I honestly can't fault anything here. It's vibrant, bouncy, challenging, but still approachable. Everything that a good Mario Kart level should be. The wind has really blown out of Tour's sails since its incredible streak of city scrambles throughout the middle portion of the list, but it's back once more with Amsterdam Drift. This map gets brownie points for being one of the only city maps to actually take you underwater through the canals and then quickly loops back around into oncoming traffic, which is such an incredibly uncommon thing to see. The calamity of driving head first into your opponents is thrilling and hilarious with the right item and perfect timing. But it's also a very pretty stage as well, hopping over to the fields of windmills and rows and rows of tulips in Holland. For a tour course, it's not the most complex, and for a non-European it might seem on the surface like many of the other stages we've previously seen, but the focus here is on the core kart racing level structure and injecting some variety into the mix with different terrain and rare opportunities for heated action moments which are crucial to the outcome of every single race. And, I mean, design-wise as well, blending both bustling streets and rural dirt tracks makes for a nice change of pace from most others, so enjoy this one while it lasts, because the Mario Karting never stops. It's time now to quickly cascade through the collapsing Grumble Volcano around twisting bends above rivers of lava and trying not to get singed as you react to the level crumbling around you. That's the appeal of Grumble that I love. With each new lap, the structural integrity of this level comes further into question, forcing you to speed up and blast through these cavernous turns to get out of here before the entire thing is under an ocean of fire and flames. The variety of paths to take, the sheer insanity of ice items flying everywhere, moving platforms, high roads to get an extra boost. This is such an intimidating level, especially if you're rocking the motion control setup. If you could consider this a desert level, given the barren landscape of charred rock and ash, then yeah, this is without question the best desert course of the series, but if that's a stretch for you, then consider this little fact. There is only one Bowser Castle level for us left to see. So by that standard, I'm not shy to call this one an honourable member of Bowser's track list, as it defines his fiery spirit flawlessly. Piranha Plant Pipeway slides the player down through the murky tunnels avoiding ferocious plants and even fiercer turns than Grumble. This chicane with the right angles is a momentum killer at the best of times, so learning how to tackle this tricky corner is essential. Then the big drive down before being launched up and out back to the classic Mario overworld makes for a thrilling little circuit with plenty more high points than there are lows. In fact, the only low that I can gather is that this one appearing in number 8 may be the sole reason that Pipeline from Tour was ultimately excluded from the booster packs in the end, as both levels are generally the same concept, but as you can see here, there is just so much more style and life with this one. It's got that character, the charm and memorability with something for both veteran and new players. I've been preaching it all day, I mean hell, I've been preaching it for years. Simplicity done right will always try over the more try-hard, complex designs when it comes to level design, and this pipeway shines the entire way through. Metaphorically, anyway. And Sky Garden from Super Circuit is yet another excellent example of this, but also an example of never underestimating the little guys, because even though this is the final level to appear, which was originally 2D, look at how high it got! It soared above the clouds to number 20! That's insane! But the enjoyment to be had on this quick cruise through the sky never ceases thanks to all of the funky little jump skips across the clouds and that cheerful, inspiring tune. If we level up a generation to the DS, we can see just how well this track flowed and allowed for exciting gameplay moments despite its simplicity. 
I said earlier on that Cloudtop Cruise was just a poor man's sky garden, and I mean that, as this GBA original is rich in Mario charm and allows the player to create moments using their skills and ingenuity rather than trying to force you to feel those special feelings. So congratulations to possibly the biggest underdog of the entire series. It may be on the weakest hardware, and it's also not the original classic that generations have held dear for 30 years, but it is our number 20 spot, earning itself a golden power star from me. So congrats on a super showing from Super Circuit throughout this entire video. Definitely go give this one a play if you haven't previously, because trust me, you will not not be disappointed. On to yet another circuit, this time we're talking Yoshi Circuit, which for one of the mainline characters appearing in every iteration since day one, I'm glad that he finally got one really strong level under his belt. And even though conceptually the idea of simply outlining the silhouette of a character and calling it a racetrack sounds lazy and uninspired, the end result is one of the more unique courses, immediately recognisable with some of the most fun turns that you'll ever drift around. Eight is without question the best way to play it and make the most of the solid driving and the visual upgrades go a long way too. Yoshi Tunnel? Ew. <laughs> well at least it's on his face and not his bum. I cherish this waterfall shortcut so much. I think it defines what kart racing skips are all about. Nothing fancy, just as long as you've got the speed to carry you over, you'll be sure to follow through with the victory any day of the week. And just like that, now it's time to knock out another contender. Yep, we're at that stage in the video where games are going to start dropping like dead flies. The final Double Dash course we have to look at today is Waluigi Stadium. Yeah, I know, right? <laughs> Thinking purely about Double Dash, I mean, don't get me wrong, it's a really fun level, but is it the best in that game? Well, that's debatable. However, it has only aged like fine wine, with later revisions sparking up the energy, hyping the player with more dynamic hazards, and its most recent inclusion in number 8 just sealed the deal on this strong ranking for me. I don't know what to say, it's just a blast with snappy turns, free-flowing bends to wall ride, that segment with the mechanical plants and rotating fire whirly gigs is always a hoot, especially with the additional half pipes on either side. An absolute winner to round out the GameCube's participation on this list. While personally not my preferred Mario Kart experience, I can't deny the strong, iconic maps to come from it, and out of all the games I was new to prior to making this video, Double Dash featured the most hidden gems that I hadn't really played before, so I'm really glad that I can finally see why so many people love this entry, and with several quality exclusives, I'll be back behind the wheel sooner rather than later. In similar vein, Toad's Factory does so many things right for an otherwise beginner course. Unique mechanics like the conveyor belts, a funky layout that leads you into the sticky mud if you don't get an extra boost off of the industrial ramps, the second set of conveyors with items and objects in your path adds some randomization to each lap, and by god, that slapping tune man, I can barely keep my eyes on the road, I'm too busy tapping my knees to the beat because it's just so catchy. Am I going to be alone on this one? I feel like I've played so many similar courses a lot lower down, but this one has always just called out to me for some reason and highlights everything I loved about the Wii title. If I'm alone on this one, then that's fine with me, because this little puppy sure has a strong bite, and again, for another core character from day one, Old Mate deserves a track abundant with quality to represent his legacy. Next up is another Wii map, Moonview Highway. Another really strong entry which I imagine wouldn't sit so high up on other people's lists, but no, I think this is such a playful course, even if it is merely a basic loop through traffic like a lot of others we've seen. Any stage with hazards on the roads are a lot of fun in my opinion, and it makes getting up off of the road feel special, taking high shortcuts or even higher ridges to try and gain your advantage. A nighttime race, it's also pretty, and the cherry on top is that quick yet whimsical song that sounds like traffic, but relaxing. <laughs> yeah, relaxing traffic. I don't know how to explain it. 
but I also enjoy the wider highway section as it allows players a bit of room to move and throw their items while still being able to navigate everything else on the road and leading into that tunnel with cars down either side makes for a nerve-wracking sprint of the finish line. Especially with those damn bomb cars driving down the street. Now how on earth is that thing road legal? If you like to go fast and hit some spicy drifts, then Moonview has got you covered. Sunshine Airport is another one which truly shines for how well it's been executed. Maybe not the most Mario Kart 8 track of 8, given its limited and generic use of the anti-gravity, but ignore that. Just as a premise for a race course, this one is a show stealer thanks to the various runways, playing chicken with oncoming planes, and the extra little routes you can use to fly through each lap for the fastest time possible. I get real coconut mole vibes off of this one, if you know what I mean, which FYI, we're still yet to see coconut mole. I just find the turn so addicting. It's simple yet charming, and that luggage claim skip right before the finish line has finished the dreams of so many races over the years. It should be a statistic that's tracked and updated daily, because goddamn, is that a sneaky sucker. But while we're here, let's board a flight to another universe entirely. It's time for the final crossover into another franchise, and without debate, the greatest crossover of them all. Man, who could have expected that the cult hit Nintendo racing franchise, combined with its most successful racing franchise, would slap so hard? Well, F-Zero and Mute City deliver an adrenaline fueled fly through this anti-gravity delight. With corkscrews, tall turns and speed, speed, so much speed just all over this one. It nails that feeling of zero limits that these games achieved so well. And that song, man, holy god. It's a techno rock saxophone symphony that just speaks for itself. An absolute banger if I've ever heard one. It just gets you pumped up and keeps your heart rate at peak levels for the entire level. I could rave and rant about how good this is, but instead, now it's time to talk about the big bad Big Blue. And oh boy, this downhill adventure steals the damn show. Taking us through more winding futuristic cities perched atop mountains and waterfalls, descending down and down until we glance the ocean surface through this awesome cave flight, and then get topside again spiralling as close to the water's surface as we can before starting the big climb back up in what completes one of the greatest crossovers in video game history. One of the greatest Mario Kart tracks of all time, and once again, it delivers us a banging tune. Man, these locations are quality that not only stand tall amongst the vast majority, but walk away with ranking much stronger than most Rainbow Roads, for Christ's sake. If that doesn't deliver the message I'm trying to get across, then shut up, go play the game, and jam these kick-ass courses until your fingertips bleed, because it doesn't get much better than this. In fact, one of the only Rainbow Roads that can even compete with Big Blue has got to be the Wii installment. And even then, we are splitting hairs over this one. Flying into the rankings at number 12, this Rainbow Road can be a right pain in my ass. Don't make fun of me, I'm using tilt controls. For real though, it's a tough challenge, but the perfect blend of splendor and technical racing skill. It's got big swoops, jumps, and a magical elevator, so it's obviously pretty badass. This big section at the bottom of the course, with these two large potholes, has got to be one of the greatest set pieces in the series history, as it forces the player to gamble on their lap time if they can make the distance across. But if not, or if you're too chicken to even try, then the adjacent half pipes make for some great boost 
boosting and flips that would make Tony Hawk jealous. It's certainly taken some trial and error to nail this level theme down to the finest of details, but there is a reason that Mario Kart Wii is remembered so fondly. And just to see how this concept has evolved over the years and seeing all of the amalgamations of each rendition represented in this one track warms my heart. I mean, god damn, that's our childhoods right there. And so this one is going to live on forever. Mario Kart 60 is going to come out in 100 years and people will still be like, damn, where's Wii Rainbow Road though? Because this is a timeless classic and one that I am really sad to deny a top 10 spot. But still just so inspired by its presence in my life. Alright, now just missing out on a top 10 position. Honestly, this is like getting hit with a blue shell on that final turn and seeing everyone else passing you by. It's called getting Mario Karted and missing the top 10 by such a fine margin is the perfect demonstration of that. Time has run out for Tick Tock Clock. This is almost like a castle map, but instead of brick walls and barricades, we've got stopwatches and spinning gears. Hey, I know I talk a lot about how small guys being in a big level is really cool, but small enough to fit inside of a wristwatch? Man, that's just not realistic. But once again, its appearance in 8 is what brought this one to the top of the rankings with just how much was added in from all of the swinging pendulums and extra little details all over the place. Oh, and I've got to mention the music. It's like a child-friendly panic attack, which encapsulates all of the stress of waking up to your alarm clock before school after hitting snooze for the tenth time. And the final lap music is when you've got 60 seconds to get up out of bed, get dressed, eat breakfast and run out the door before your mum kicks you up the bum. A timeless race that gets your ass moving from the moment that green light flashes and provides a constant rush until you make it all the way to the end in record time. As we finally enter the top 10. And just like that, we have only 10 levels remaining. Oh man, this, this <laughs> ranking these top spots is going to be brutal, okay? I mean, this has already been one of the toughest rankings that I've ever attempted, given to the sheer volume of incredible quality exuberated from this franchise over 30 years, and this top 10 is no different. I, I think that you'll agree with me that most of these tracks define what we love about the Mario Kart franchise. That, you know, they capture that special feeling of holding magic at your fingertips as possibly the greatest kart racing levels ever created. So, with no further time wasting, let's commence a very special top 10 with a very big elimination. Kicking things off at number 10 is Toad Harbor from Mario Kart 8, and after a staggering 96 courses, this is the final entry for this game. This map has it all and defines exactly what made this title so special. It's bright and cheery, the track provides multiple different paths to take which wind and climb up through the coastal village to the top of the hill where you'll find the tram. This building to the left is also an impressive wall ride opportunity before taking the big slope back down again, gaining air and hopefully gaining an advantage. Is it the most technically impressive map? No. Is it the toughest? No. And it's not a Rainbow Road or a Bowser's Castle, it's just Toad Harbor, and it's a definitive example of the Mario Kart format executed to perfection, ending off the incredible run for one of the most impressive games in the franchise to date. With what was already such a strong game before the deluxe port, it's now overflowing with endless content for future generations to enjoy, with an all-star cast and all of the best levels the franchise has to offer. Well, almost all of them. 
In fact, there are only two tracks in the top 10 which do not feature in Mario Kart 8, which is a strong statistic in its own right if you ask me. Snubbed from a Mario Kart 8 remaster, Airship Fortress is getting its respect here as this is a standout castle course, avoiding bullet bills upon boarding the iconic airship and making our way down below. Before long, BOOM! You get fired out of one of the cannons and torpedoed into the castle tower for an extended downward spiral which makes for a perfect moment before completing your next lap. Borrowing from all of the classic maps to create a modern twist given that we rarely see airships throughout the Mario Kart games beyond only a handful of levels, this one has Super Nintendo Bowser Castle vibes but in the good way, like its 3D counterpart from Tour and to my surprise, I have also played this map in Tour and it holds up really well in that game too. A good mid-level difficulty map that holds a special place in the hearts of many as an experience now only exclusive to the DS family of portable titles and Tour on mobile. And that is if you're lucky enough to catch it in rotation. But one level that I am glad to see in number 8 is Coconut Mall, so let's dip in for some retail therapy because nobody can possibly be depressed with that sickeningly upbeat tune echoing throughout this concrete jungle. Above, below, and all around, this track is a supermarket sweep with plenty of fun drifts, hidden cuts, races popping in and out of nowhere, and as long as you're not contending with those damn escalators, then you've got a sure footing for victory. Nothing beats taking the high road on the final lap and launching down to the car park below to take away a decisive victory, and since its first appearance on the Wii, Coconut Mall has appeared again and again, defining that this is a must-have course for any future Mario Kart games. Don't discount it just for its simplicity, as this is far more than your average- oh, Get off the road, you idiot! Oh god, what was I saying? Oh yeah, Coconut Mall is damn awesome, dude. You know it is. <laughs> Ooh, all right, the final tour level is, to my surprise, one of the greatest kart racing maps that I maybe have ever played. Going pedal to the metal against Greek gods through the Parthenon, launching from high up cliffs, this stage is an adventure throughout history with so many great set pieces, from the stairs of the various monuments, drifting through the theatre and then quickly launching from the waterfall that sits atop its vertical mountain walls. It's got a courageous tune that screams of an epic journey which is why I decided to play Link for this level. I just think he really fits well and quite frankly, there is no reason that a tour level is outclassing a Legend of Zelda themed Mario Kart level by 60 odd points, but here we are. It's just a true testament not to ignore Tour, simply because it's a mobile game with all of the usual red flags. As a Mario game, it's got the largest roster of any, the largest track list of any at 103, which doesn't even include any of the remixed variations or alternate versions by the way, and on top of them all, standing tall, is Athens Dash. Just an absolute masterclass in level design. Design, fitting of its once incredible empire centered on the gorgeous views of the Acropolis. Incredible, man. Just incredible. I can't get enough of it. Well, well, well. Look who we have here. We have ranked 150 tracks now, and Wario has climbed the entire mountain with one of the strongest ranking positions of the entire video. I just want to say that I am impressed. That turnaround in real time was roughly a decade, but what a difference it made as the DS Wario Stadium is an absolute show stealer. Even just seeing gameplay of this one led me to finally pick up the DS game for the very first time and I've been in love with it ever since. It just gets all of the corners right, the straightaways and mudslides don't slow down the pace and there are some gnarly sick jumps through rings of fire. Not to mention, it's also got a banger of a tune, but we'll talk about that a little more soon as it's reused on another track. 
but it's an incredible track, and its revival within 8 couldn't be more deserved, as this only amplifies its greatness. Now with everything in HD, we've got this massive mid-air S-Bend introducing just that extra amount of flow and changing up the course beyond a generic dirt track. And the flooded area is great too, keeping the player on their toes and forcing you to adjust to the environment after every corner. I love this one, and I will vouch for it until the day I die. And we still have more DS levels to go! But, can this game take away a podium spot? This one cannot be overlooked, as the original known as Music Park in 7 on the 3DS was an absolute show stealer and a defining course introduced by that game. Its charming theme of the player driving along pianos and xylophones, creating chimes in time with the beat of the music, is always so satisfying, as every single one of these requires a calculated drift, as you need to be careful not to fall through the walls. The bouncy drums and music notes send your carts flying, at which point you can gain an extra boost if you time your jump just right, and oh, that subtle cut on the final corner, make sure you've got a musical instrument of your own to clear the way, because that one is essential. A real high note that sadly fell flat, right at the end of the race, but knocking out the final DS levels in record time, up last of all we have Waluigi Pinball. I mean, come on, you knew this was going to be in the top 10. People don't shut up about this track, and rightfully so, as it's clear that God himself handed this course down from the heavens and blessed us with some of the slickest turns, blistering visuals, and heart-racing karting ever to grace a game console. Launching at hyperspeed to the top of the machine, I've got to say, what an excellent theme for a level. Pinball alone is bloody awesome, as it's like a roller coaster in there, so it makes for a really fun time sliding your way down through, avoiding the giant metallic balls, and let me just say that if you take issue with this map for whatever reason, then prove that you've got the balls and voice your opinion below, because quite honestly, I could never understand a human being who didn't love this track. The pretty lights are great, but that song from Wario Stadium DS is back again and fits this theme even more perfectly. Seeing that smug face waiting for you at the bottom of the track, oh, I could kiss it, because I've been waiting and waiting and waiting to gush over this level since I started working on this project months ago. And while this may be the end of the race for the DS Mario Kart, once again, this is the defined peak of the franchise, delivering bangers in record numbers throughout the rankings as we now reach our podium positions. This is it guys, the big three. Hold on to your butts. In at number three, we have Maple Treeway on the Wii, continuing to prove my point that this period in time defines the success of this franchise. This has got to be the most heartwarming track, as if the autumn jaunt through the bright orange trees wasn't nostalgic enough, but then launching up through the leaves to ride gnarled up branches to the peak and finding a few wigglers wiggling around. And then, like a little worm, you get to plummet through the tree trunk and fly down to the starting area. For as hectic as things can be atop the treetops, this one is just so relaxing with that breathtaking tune. I mean, just take a listen. Doesn't that just fill your soul up? And much the same as how Coconut Mall has appeared in every game since its debut, Shreeway has done the same, proving just how important this level is to the franchise's history, and once again showing us that the Wii title truly was the peak of the franchise. With so many great, highly memorable courses, even the ones which didn't place so high up are all still fun and scratch that kart racing itch but there is one Wii level in particular which stands above them all, as not only the best Wii course, but also the best in another category. Alright, here we are, the final two. Who is going to get slammed with that blue shell right on the finish line? Number two is... That's 
right. Coming in second place and earning silver is Bowser's Castle on the Wii, the premier gauntlet of panic, challenge and technical driving. Opening up on the drawbridge, leaping through the front door into a twisted entrance of snaking square turns and thwomp infested straightaways, you eventually break free into a burning tube of lava and fire being launched out by the man himself. Taking several notes from Double Dash, the course ends with a very similar final corner and familiar view leading back to the finish line along with those same dastardly corners inside. But it's the half pipe area which stands out the most to me as you've got to be quick on the pedal to avoid sinking into the molten magma below, forcing the player to new heights catching air and using that boost to blast by King Cooper and escape the deadly castle one final time. This course hits every note correctly. Even the song might just be the most intimidating of all of them from this theme. I absolutely love it, man, and it clearly takes the cake as later castle levels would continue the trend of borrowing from this masterpiece. I am sad to see the Wii game finally eliminated, but it was one hell of a run from start to finish, and in my opinion, rightfully deserves its place on the podium. However, there is only one course left. The grand champion taking that golden prize home. Have you been keeping a close eye? Do you have any guesses as to what might possibly be left? <sighs> Man. What is the best Mario Kart level is going to be one of those debates which will outlive us all. So, while we're still here, can I get a drum roll please? The number one best Mario Kart level of all time is... Rainbow Road 7 on the 3DS. And what a fitting tribute to this great franchise after our long, long search. We finally found the definitive Rainbow Road experience. With all of the majestic grandeur we've come to love, plenty of challenging turns, especially this funky one, which was sadly nerfed in the deluxe version, much to my disappointment, it incorporates everything which makes these games good, paying respect to veteran players while also inspiring those who may be new to this track. Whether they grew up playing the original on 3DS or had their first experiences with it on the Switch, it's the finer details which this track does that definitely helps it to stand tall above all of the rest in its field. Circling asteroids in space, racing rings around Saturn, how is this the only terrestrial location in the franchise to take advantage of this setting and use it to create stunning imagery which stays with you long after playing? I mean, launching off the end of a rainbow to land on the moon and jump craters, suspended in time floating above due to the lower gravity, there's no other course like it. And even more importantly to me, this is one of the few rainbow roads where nothing is automated. There's no elevators, no launches, no big loops or corkscrews, nothing that takes control away from the player. It's all in your hands, and the final segment of this rally speeding through the spinning tube and having the option to take the high or low path keeps things fresh with each new race. Fly above to avoid items or take advantage of the boosts below. For the final time in this video, I'd just like to say that as a PlayStation kid growing up and missing out on the boom of Nintendo portables until I became an adult, Finally getting to go back and discover the incredible magic of a level like this creates those memories which feel nostalgic and many years old even though they might only be quite new to me personally. I'd never heard or seen much, if any, of this level in the past and wouldn't you know it, before long I was playing this one on loop again and again, just losing myself in its majesty. 
Yo, I have played every single Mario Kart game, ranked every single level in what has been a grueling couple of hours, but this journey through the galaxy of kart racing's biggest name has fulfilled me like no other project in a long time. So I just want to share my thanks along with all of the others who cherish this series of games, the characters, and the unforgettable experiences for those lifelong moments in time. And just like that, 3DS Rainbow Road drives off into the sunset to end off this every level ranked. Oh man, oh man, what an epic video. I'd like to thank everyone so much for making it all the way through, and if you enjoyed it, definitely remember to subscribe if you liked that, and check out some of my other videos, because there's plenty more where that came from, and if you enjoy those, please take a moment to click share, as that's worth so much more to a channel's success than even subscribing does, as that helps to get my stuff out there onto new eyes. If you're a patron of the channel, then you get an extra special thank you, as that support is what helps make these larger projects possible, and if you think I've earned it today, then you can head over to patreon.com slash squareeyejack and sign up if you want to see me celebrate this video finally being finished by building an old Mario Kart Wii Kinect set that I've been sitting on for years now. I had a blast finally putting that thing together, and there is also a whole collection of more exclusive content over there waiting for you. And lastly, I'd like to thank all of my friends and my amazing partner who always chip in with each video, contributing ideas and helping me to stay motivated because without them, then I honestly don't think that I'd be coming up on such a major anniversary for the channel next year. But anyway, <laughs> that's enough shilling from me for one video. Man, I need to sleep after all of that. So thank you all so much for watching. I'm Square Eyed Jack, and I hope you have a great fucking day. And I'll see you all next time somewhere on that magical journey through the stars.